we went to visit the king of vintage frames at his stunning new store located in South Beach, Miami. Corey Shapiro opened up his first flagship in Montreal in 2014 and has recently expanded to Miami with a store at the Good Time Hotel. We dive into Corey's come up in the vintage eyewear industry, as well as his thoughts on the highs and lows of being an entrepreneur. Let's not forget this episode is presented by Boda Casino. So sit back, relax, and join us for a journey into the world of vintage frames. They know that I go flip mode when I bust the rhymes. Man's on a different thing when I told him a hundred times. I did a bunch of crimes and none of them were done for the vine. So you can take that bullshit and stick that where the sun don't shine. The summer's up, it's about to get real cold. Late nights in the studio with the bros. Welcome back to the MBH Podcast. Money buys happiness. Guys, before we get into it, you already know what to do. Like, subscribe, do the fucking duties, okay? The boys are out in Miami. Ernesto, where the fuck we at? South Beach, baby. Yes, Listen, I'm wearing a pair of crazy shades right now. <laughs> and there's crazy shades all around me. Um, and shout out to my guy, Corey Shapiro, for that because... He's putting us on the swag right now, all right? Check out this store. You guys can see it in the background. Um, just opened here in South Beach. Congratulations, by yes, the way. Sir. Yes, sir. And thanks for... Am I for... supposed to hold this? Is that... Yeah, no, I probably you don't have hold to, it. You know. probably, it probably worked better. Um, I mean, you get the, you get okay, the, I'll hold the it. ice, I'll hold too, it you know? We got some makeshift... <laughs> uh, we got a makeshift podcast studio it's right fine. now. It's fine. But I like it. I appreciate it. This is a very you. elegant studio for it to be labeled as makeshift. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. look around, bro. Makeshift... Okay, table and chair. And you ain't not studio. And you should have added in your you know intro that you're a shady guy. Oh, but... Yeah. Yeah. And that's and that's and that's really why we're here. Okay. Listen, the intro's not even done yet, though. To no be problem. honest, no problem. Going. You started in Montreal. I did vintage frames. Yes, I did. Made it all the way here to South Beach. Yes, like a fucking boss. Like a boss. I love it. Inspiring yeah. as hell. We're trying to do the same thing. Toronto to Miami, kind of same thing. Yeah. Um, you got to get rid of the mustache. That's that's the no. key. They're not they're not gonna let you through customs. <laughs> I've been having trouble at customs. I, I'm not gonna I, lie. I, I, stopped, I, well, it gives. They ask a lot of questions. Because you look like a pervert. <laughs> I, I mean, that's that's why you're supposed Yo, to mustache like, coming off. You got to put on a mock neck. Right. Be you know, be low key. You're Come coming on, through bro. like a pervert, okay, okay. <laughs> guys. Mustache off right after this pod. Yeah. Um, but we got we got a good one because I think you got a crazy story. I think you got yeah. a very inspiring story. Uh, I've you. been following you for a bunch of years now. Word up. Um, it's a wild so ride. It's a crazy. It's a also a very like unique and and different industry than I think people are used to mm -hmm. or involved in at all. Um, so yeah. definitely want to go way back. Okay. And uh, sure. just talk about how you first got started in this industry. Mm. What in, in fashion or in, in uh, or were in you life? in fashion before you got um, into glasses? Well, I guess it's kind of the same. It thing. is. It is the same, but so I was in when I was young, like young, young, um, a kid, I was like big into collectibles. So okay. it was like yeah. trading cards and beanie babies actually. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah. I mean, shit. I came up on Beanie Babies. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I, I always wanted to make a chain that said Beanie Baby Rich. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was into collectibles and stuff. And um, that was like a big thing for me when I was a kid. Like I don't come from a you know wealthy family or anything like that. So not that I needed to necessarily make money to yeah. do shit, but I needed to make money to do the shit that I wanted to at a, a fairly young age. Um, how old were you when you were doing the collectibles and, and like you were into that? Seven, eight, oh, like wow. seven really to 14. Early. Yeah. Okay. And like, I really kind of excelled in a collectible market, understanding that there's different values at different places. And like, you guys are from Canada, but you're not from the asshole part of Canada. Like I am where they want to speak French and, inf and enforce the French. So like stupid shit, like Star Wars figures coming and having French and English on a box made them more collectible in the States. Um, and that kind of notion of being able to trade products across borders and increase value of things that weren't necessarily as valuable where they were actually from yeah. was a major thing. And that stemmed into um, sneaker collecting. So like original sneaker collecting, not like this weird commodity shit. Um, <laughs> So I used to take my grandfather because we're pretty close to Plattsburgh, Montreal, okay. and I would make him go and drive me to Plattsburgh, which was like an hour and a half away to get the shoes that were only released there. And as I kind of grew um, as really a true sneaker collector, because I was a fat kid, so I had no business like <laughs> I was the best dressed baseball player on the fucking field. <laughs> but Yo, if you shot a ball, I was like, <laughs> I was like, nah, I'm so cool. So you're about the swag though. You're about yeah, the no, swag. no. I got, you know, I had the, I had the illest. Ellis baseball gloves and batting gloves and shoes and, you know, that type of shit. So the cool thing kind of later on was before Nike 
which was really the first company to do it, like Adidas second and, yeah. and so on and so on. But before Nike had realized that they could control sneaker collecting and make it kind of this abusive industry, every, let's say, if it was Foot Locker, every Thursday Foot Locker would release, let's say, three models. And if you were a true sneaker collector, you were buying those colorways. So it was like an Air Force, a Dunk or whatever. And you would be able to save up for the week to get that colorway. But if you were a real sneaker collector, you knew that the same day in the States or in Europe or in Japan, they also released like regular colorways, but they were rare. Like a Canadian colorway was rare in the States and vice versa okay. and shit like that. So kind of modified that whole ideology and started doing that. And I had a sneaker store, um, a sneaker store when I was 19, which was like the first real collector sneaker store and i'm not like not throwing shade at anyone that does it because some of my homies are like really ill in it mm -hmm. when um, was it? what year was this and you did the sneaker store fuck i am i'm 40 now Doesn't so i was 19 yeah like around then wow okay. yeah that's yeah. the first guy yeah, <laughs> yeah. like definitely all, bro, yeah sure. definitely the first but in canada we had good foot which was like super good ill foot, yeah, yeah. yeah shout out to matt george and that that was really like that was a real sneaker store um, they had an account. I didn't have an account, and we were selling actual vintage stuff. Versus Matt was selling like, you know, other stuff. Um, and before that, I had like kind of in the mix of the collectibles and and other stuff. I went to fashion school, started a, a fashion brand, and um, the way fashion school works is is like a final project, and you have to work up to this final project, and then you have to compete in this final project. But they didn't want me to compete because I didn't really have to do anything. I could have just handed. It. Like, well, here's my business and yeah. fuck off and yeah. like, give me the trophy. I'm out. Yeah. Um, and I'm a little bit of a dick. So, you know, no. I was fairly, you know, <laughs> fairly antagonizing to them. So um, we decided to part ways and I had a non-disclosure at the sign and all this type oh, of shit. shit. And from school? From school, yeah. But I, I wanted to ask you this yeah. too. Like, is Montreal, Montreal's like known for their fashion schools and stuff, right? Aren't mm -hmm. they? Isn't there a school no. there? Isn't there some sort of- Montreal is known for credit card uh, scammers, <laughs> telemarketing, and uh, strip clubs when you can touch the girls. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, and maybe maybe wrong. like a restaurant or two. But I guess I got that wrong. But you yeah. you were saying something earlier where it was like you were saying how you knew like okay the 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 Star Wars with the Canadian and the yeah. French on it was yeah. worth more you know in the states whatever. Yeah. But like at that time, internet like how are you like how are you realizing that? Because it's not yeah. like it's not like you just pop on so, IG and find that. No, out. there was, definitely was no like I don't even think MySpace was really up at that yeah, point. No. Um, but I had friends that were different, you know, in different places, okay. and because I was kind of involved in music a bit um, and got to tour with people, and you, you kind of like learn that whole gamut of it. Um, the common denominator in collectibles, which was very interesting and kind of plays a huge role into how we did this, is there's something called um, the Beckett Guide, okay. which I don't collect trading cards now. And in comics, I think it was the Wizard Guide. But basically once a month, there was a guide that came out that told you okay. this is the price and, and your card is in this condition. It's worth this price. And that kind of became the baseline of the industry, you know? So... The interesting thing was, even from a young age, it was like, how do you become the authority in an industry where you can create the baseline of pricing, mm -hmm. but at the same time, how do you control the commodity? And like, if you could control the commodity, you could fuck around with the players and you could dictate the prices. Yeah, kind of hard, kind of hard to you know compete. Yeah, you know, so um, <laughs> that's why we, you have no competition. It's not, that, it's not that I don't have. It's that's not true. It's not that I don't have any competition. I don't have any competition that is willing to compete with me. I'm because I'm a sick fucking. Dude. Say, what are you saying on your on your like, scale, like your volume that you're doing? Um, no, no, I, no, I, I think me I, yeah, just because I'm a lunatic. <laughs> like, yeah. No, that's really what it is. Like, like, like I can't no, it's, it's like you know guy. you like the this is typically an optical industry, right? And that's like opticians, optometrists, yes. shit like that. Like when I walk into an optical trade show, they look at me and they're like, oh, they're like, they don't know if I'm there to sign autographs or they should take their wallets and throw it <laughs> the other way and run. And I'm so aggressive with, with them um, or with people in general and like so in your face that most people don't want to, you know, don't want to kind of fuck around and do that. Do you think it's because it's like an older industry? Where it's like well, it's older, industry? it's older an industry and like people just aren't as much fun. There's yeah. no why question. You, but what, like, why do you move like that? Have you always been like yeah, that? Yeah, like, I'm, I'm a fucking been? lunatic, dude. <laughs> I'm, you know. 
Like, you know what I mean? I, even as a kid, were you always that kid? Like, I was always, always that kid. I'm yeah. just, I'm just much, uh, much better financed okay. at this point. And, <laughs> and really like all I do is I think the goal of most people, especially that don't, or maybe I, I don't know because I didn't come from a wealthy background, but oh. I think that most people work to be able to fulfill their childhood dreams. You know, and just some people are more honest about how they want to do that and how they don't. Like, yeah. I like to go places in a bathrobe. That's just what I want to do. You know, and I, I always, today, bro. you know, I was, I was going to, but I didn't, I was, I was going to, cause there's one that's part of the hotel, but I didn't know if like Dave and them would get offended if I showed up and had to go to bathroom. So I was like, let's, let's just do white shirt. But yeah, no, I do things the way that I, like I move, like I'm a, just ticking off my bucket list as a child. Yeah. I want to drive a golf cart. It's illegal, but I'm intelligent enough to engage with the police where I don't get caught. And if I do, I'm also a great sport about it. And, yeah. you know, win, great, lose, uh, equally as great, you yeah. know? So where it becomes dangerous to compete with me, it's so dangerous to compete with someone that's equally as happy when they win as when they lose yeah. because then there's no baseline yeah. you know and there's no goal post it's just because yeah. yeah because i don't even know how to win so let alone how would you know how to beat me yeah. you know yeah. and like at, at what point do you throw the flag yeah. and so um you know i've kind of created this lane in this industry and um done something that is very you know real and when it goes back to where i say that Nike started to control hype when Nike realized that people were sneaker collectors and started to go on to Nike talk forums and see guys like, you know, Homicide and DJ AM, you know, uh, who's obviously no longer with us, unfortunately, and Ben Baller and, you know, Air Rev, um, Adam Levinson, and like guys from the high and mighty, like real sneaker dudes and realized they could bring in people like Futura and Stash to do collabs and Stussy and shit like that and kind of tap a culture, the culture took an interesting turn. Mm -hmm. But it was based on contriving the hype, right? And the, the thing that made vintage frames m more dangerous than anything is the educational part about it because I'm an actual fashion history major, which is very rare, um, most people don't want to do that or understand that it's a discipline. And most people don't have enough balls to actually invest in a fashion cycle. So people are being reactive to what goes on and they're, there's not that education. You know? So I don't necessarily care if you come in and buy a pair of glasses, but you should know about the history. You should understand the experience. You should understand that whole thing. And that's kind of like what happened with vintage frames. So when people are trying to compete, they're trying to acquire the knowledge of what's going on in a current state. And in essence, reacting to what, you know, not only me, but in a large format that I'm creating. And they're just kind of like biting at, at the heel of it, which yeah. is fine. And like, not that people shouldn't be able to eat and do their own shit. And, you know, sure. um, and there were people before me, um, but no one's kind of staked a claim and said, okay, I'm taking control of this. This is how we're doing it. And, um, you know, this is my line in the sand and I'm excited yeah. if you jump over it because I'm ready to go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'll go to war. Well, I, have, I have two things. Sure. Okay. Um, the first one is you were clearly like driven at a young mm -hmm. age, right? Mm -hmm. You were clearly motivated. You were doing things. You said you started, you, you opened up your first store. Yeah. When I was 19. 19. Like yeah. that's no, not many people can do that. No. So what was... What was the fire? What, what, where did that come from? So I, um, I was, uh, I wasn't poor, but I, but I was like very, very, very like lower middle class okay. and it wasn't how I wanted to do things. And, yeah. you know, at one point, generally later on in life, people define that they have needs and they have wants. Sure. Um, I didn't want there to be any lines between that. I just wanted it to be, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And how do we achieve that? Um, and that whole mentality kind of switched when, um, you know, Montreal, like, again, you guys come from Toronto. We were discussing Toronto, like, I think is really big in supporting people on their way up. As you have, like, also addressed, they're not super supportive all the time. Like, there's a bit of a hump yeah. when people have done better than them. But Montreal's a, a big reversal. Montreal, they won't support you until you've 
don't need them. And then they're like, oh, uh, yeah, I went to school with Corey or I fucking this or that. Yeah, it's yeah, like, I had his shoes before. It's like, cool, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> I, like that's whatever. And I, I appreciate all the good, even if it's, if it's the bad. Um, but the problem with Montreal is that people want to harp on failure and they want to see failure as a failure. Mm. And I don't see failure as a failure. Like, it's cool that you went and spent all this money on school and that's great. And I spent money on school too. I got it. I got the same end result. I got out. I got a piece of paper that I could. Well, this is I what I wanted to ask you. jerk off on. Yeah. Like, it does nothing. That's what I wanted to ask you nothing. about the school because we talk about traditional yeah. schooling all the time. Yeah. Right? And we believe that there's certain industries where you need to do it and yeah. certain industries where you don't. I'm not really this, sure about yours. Not, no, like, do you think right. that you needed that to be where you are today? So I, need, well, I needed the school, I guess, just well, just to kind of close the loop on, yeah. on the comment before. Because Montreal wants to say, oh, someone tried and they failed. And remember, they failed and they failed and they failed. Until, the, until you don't give a shit about that. And you're like, yeah, well, you know, that failure for 10 grand was my year in school while you're sitting there fucking holding your dick. Still did nothing, yeah. Did nothing, you know. And so the school that I went to, which I'm allowed to talk about finally, LaSalle College, um, kind of went, it was interesting because there's two avenues. You could either go into design and marketing or marketing. Design um, is technical. So you need to understand and make the patterns. Like there's, you need to know how to sew, all that type of shit. But in marketing, and I think it's kind of interesting that now in life, especially like coming from like guys like the Nelk Boys, guys like you, dudes who do Happy Dad, like they're not formally trained marketers, you know? And if they would have been in school, they probably would have been kicked out of school, you know? And it's not, it's not like we are the people that are paving the way in that world. So in marketing, either you have it or you don't. But within the marketing discipline, fashion history was the only thing that was concrete and real and, under, and understanding, you know, trends. Yeah. So that was kind of what, you know, what I had focused in it. And there was a whole interesting gap of time, which was fucking weird that the teachers wanted to teach you about like the Baroque periods and shit like that. But it was like, what happened? What about the 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s, like 70s? Like, where are you at with that? Yeah. Why are you discrediting that knowing that, like, didn't you speak to the teacher in the other class that told you that <laughs> this is a fucking fashion cycle? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. where's the disconnect? So within the first three weeks of school, one of my friends who was not in the school, who um, was not a contributing member to society, got the fucking teacher pregnant. Come yeah, on. got this bitch pregnant, dead ass, <laughs> right? God. And I was like, yo, I was like, listen, I was like, I was like, no offense or anything, but like, I can't, I can't learn from you. Like, you're, you're banging people that are my age. You're dumb as fuck. And, and if you slept with that dude, like, you should go to the doctor and get checked out. Like, like skip class. I got you, you know. And so that was. That was kind of where I was like, this is not like yeah, yeah. great. I think a lot um, of people, they're, they're in school and they're looking at their prof and their prof is a professor in business. And this guy has never... She was a professor in but sucking but dick. She, <laughs> and they never had a business she, before. You know? You know? So it's like the people that they're learning from are actually not inspiring them at all. Is that Ooh. something that you felt at school? Well, I mean, yeah, she was smashing right? the besides, she was, besides Well, she was... Her, yeah, you know. Was there, was there something common like, besides the, the whole teacher? Um... Like, were you ever in a class like, bro, like, I know more than what this guy's talking about? No. So no? the int I never think that I know more than anyone. Okay. Um, and I think that that's kind of a tooling that you have to have because Facts. even if someone knows less than you, the, the perspective and where they're coming from is almost more valuable than the, in than the information. True. So I, I'll listen to the smartest person in the room, but I also want to hear who the stupidest in the room is because... They might be talking about the different thing, and if you can hone in on what is someone's perspective and why are they getting there, um, I think that that value is is tremendous. True, you know, it shows that you're a marketer, though, to be honest. That just shows that you're in tune with marketing and paying attention to what people pay attention to and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you apply that to here, like you're going to hear someone talk about something, and you might apply that to your business somehow. Yeah. We interrupt this podcast to bring you the most important message of your whole entire existence. Okay, it's Sunday. You're chilling. You're fucking with the boys. You're with your girl. You're buzzing out. A couple brews, maybe no brews at all. It doesn't matter. You're buzzing out. You got the computer open. You're like, hey, bro, I feel like playing some poker today. Yeah. And I know the place you got to go to play that poker. Okay. Bodon Casino, baby. It's so simple. You hop in, 
Every single Sunday, they have two hundred thousand dollars in guaranteed prizes. No, two hundred k. Like, are you guys hearing that? Two hundred k every Sunday. It's like boom. No better way to spend an evening than ripping a little fucking poker full house. Give me the doubles, bro. Give me everything. Give me a triple. Give me a straight. Give me a flush. Two hundred k prizes every Sunday, Bulldog. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like to me, that's like. Unreal, dude. Who else wow. is doing that? Who else is really doing that? Royal flush. Royal flush. I like a nice royal flush. <laughs> that, oh, so do I. A fuck. nice royal flush fires me up. Listen, Give me guys. If you didn't sign up to Bodog yet, number one, I don't know what you're doing. Yep. But number two, if you are a Canadian. Yep. If you are Canadian and you sign up to Bodog today, mm. we will give you we a four hundred dollar welcome bonus. Boom. That means we will match up to four hundred dollars on your first deposit. Boom. Not bad, eh? Not Plus bad. 50 free spins to get you a little fired up. Get a little pre going, you know? Yep, yep. Get your money up, all right? And use crypto when you're betting on Bodog, all right? Crypto withdrawals, crypto deposits, crypto in my wallet, please. Do you understand? <laughs> Let's go. Yo, it's in, it's out. It's out, then it's back in. Seconds, seconds. Do you understand? It's quick. These guys are lightning fast. So you already know what to do. Tap in with the boys. We're also streaming live on Twitch every single week on Boda. Where else are we doing it? So with that being said, let's get back to this episode. I want to go back quickly. You said something that like- You want to know You want to know about the teacher, right? No, no. <laughs> she, Does she have she big, she, Does she she have big, big ass tits. But, um, yeah, go ahead. Drop the IG, let's no, go. No, I'm, no, I'm curious. You, I'm, well, I'm not curious. You said something that I resonate with where when he was asking you, what was your drive? You know, and you're like, yo, I came from a regular family, whatever. But at the end of the day, like you were just trying to make money. Like you were just trying to yeah. get rich. And like, it's not actually not get rich because I don't know what I don't. I think if you have to, if you think that you're going to get rich, you have to have a benchmark. Yeah. And I think that my problem in general is I have no, like, well, your benchmark, was I have like, no, I, I don't I have no goals. Yeah. You know? <laughs> your benchmark was like being able to do anything in a row. Like, you see yeah. what I'm trying to say? Well, like, exactly. Yeah. So, so, but, but like that, uh, for me, that's enough. Like, I think everyone's always looking for like this, oh, my grandma died and then yeah. my, my family had no money and then yeah. our house burned down. It's like, yo, sometimes people are just like, they just got this hunger to yeah. to grow, build a business, make money just because they want certain things. In it could life. be anything. It could be like you were a kid and you seen a Ferrari drive by and you're like, damn. Like, I, I know what I mean. You know, like, it's just, it doesn't got to be so Depends what, what you're inspired by. so much emotion behind it is what I'm trying to say. Some people just want it. I would, you know, I was, because of how in tune I was with my own insanities <laughs> and willing to, it's, it's true that- <laughs> <laughs> just um, staring in the mirror no, because like, you know like a lot of people do shit and they're like like the parents would look at them and be like do you know what you just did and they'd be like oh no i didn't i didn't fucking realize it it's like you don't think that i know what i just did <laughs> motherfucker while you're catching me here trust me something is going on there yeah. you're like yeah. i'm so in tune with it and so accountable but you know a little bit of a chip on my shoulder in this kind of david and goliath type fight with anything mm. And um, why it's hard to compete with me because I am willing to go against the biggest and the baddest and step on people's toes, you know, until they look at me in the eyes and ready to go. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, like certain parents were like, oh, you shouldn't play, play with him. Like I, I was, I was, yeah. One of those kids. <laughs> well, I was one of those kids in, especially in school and like in school, one of the many that I uh, had the pleasure to attend, one of the principals was like, listen, your kid is either going to be, you know, the richest one in the room or he's going to be the uni bomber. And there's no in between. Last guy called and you like, hey, he did, he did, Fuck, he did. Bro. Yeah, he did. <laughs> That's a stretch. Yeah. yeah, well, it was pretty, <laughs> you know. It's not, it's not that, I, you know, it's not, there was no bombs that were going to be involved, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I have an ability to rile the masses. Mm. And, and I've always had that. And, I think that, you know, now we can dress the way that we want. We can go the places that we want. We can do all that type of stuff. But, you know, take poppy steak as, as like a thing just because we're in Miami. A restaurant like that of that caliber, when I was a kid, you needed to go in in a suit jacket. You needed to look like the people that he has in the pictures, which are reminiscent of that time. Yeah. You couldn't go into a place without a blazer. You couldn't go in a backwards hat, mm. like a hat in general, you yeah. know? So there was this whole stereotype of what does success look like? 
And that whole stereotype and the fact that people were like, oh, you know, he might be a little rough for my friend and the, the, or my kid and this whole thing was like a real, you know, fire under my ass. And, mm. um, and it's funny because, you know, some of the parents these days, like I, um, I live around, I live around the corner from one of the parents from this mother. I'm not friends with the son, but she wouldn't let her kid play with me. I was like, oh my God, the fucking the devil like no way poor poor little guy and now every time i drive by you know she wants to she wants to, the bitch is waving at me on my golf cart and you know i always knew you always knew nothing <laughs> you always knew fucking nothing Wait, yeah. on your road on the golf cart though yeah i drive golf carts in montreal i illegally drive golf like carts. just on the street yeah like fully on the street like you got to go grow, like to shop or whatever you just go yeah i go and i have no clue and and i'm also completely like like I, I can design a light, but if you ask me how to change a light bulb, I have no fucking clue. Yeah, you're done, yeah. Zero, <laughs> like no clue. And thank God my friends know like what I'm capable of. What I'm capable of, I'm great. I don't say that I can do more than I can, and they know that they have to kind of compensate in the rest. Yeah. <laughs> so I have these. Go I my first one, I bought a vintage Mercedes SL golf cart okay. that I drive around, and I would like. I would I drive my in my bathrobe, obviously, and <laughs> I would take my bulldog. And I would have these conversations on Instagram and I would let my dog pick the lawn that he would want to shit on. And then he would jump off, he would shit on the lawn. Like we would get, we would get letters from our neighbors because they, they like, some of them wanted to be part of the shtick, other, others didn't. Yeah. And um, so then, and then for my 40th last year, because I guess I'm the only person that drives a golf cart that's not on a golf course um, and it's very illegal in the city. Someone hit me up. They're like, yo, there's this uh, Escalade golf cart. And it's a big one. And I was like, great. Like, you know, what else are you going to do on a Sunday? <laughs> so, cards. you know, I take my daughter and I'm like, uh, we're going to go buy a golf cart. She's fucking great. You know, she's <laughs> six. Yeah, six at the time. We went, we bought this like six seater um, Escalade golf cart and I drive it around and I live in a pretty conservative neighborhood too. And everyone knows who I am. Regardless, like when I moved into this neighborhood, it was like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air <laughs> moving in in day one, like demolition. And yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's like a slightly religious area. Neighbors are very nice, except for one of them, which I can't talk about because he sends me lawyer's letters. The dumb prick. Um, and yeah, it's funny. I actually bought the house also because um, he worked for a company that I first bought one of my vintage stock from. It's actually his brother. I think it's his brother okay. um, or brother-in-law. And when I bought the stock, everyone was like, they were like bringing people into the room like as if it was a joke that I was buying this vintage stock. And oh, come laugh at this. Laugh at the little fucking fat kid, yeah. you know? <laughs> and um, I don't think he was really laughing when I bought the house next to him, mm, you know? It wasn't so funny. Nah, Not that funny anymore. Nah, nah, wasn't that funny, buddy. <laughs> wasn't that funny, buddy. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, just, I'm just picturing you in a golf cart in a fucking robe driving yeah, a robe. like that's a movie dude i mean it's not you know and i'll that's go and i'll it's just it's it's how i want to live you know no, and all these little doing that in toronto how that was no chance no no no. we'd be arrested we got no chance hours. yeah well Me, I, you got no chance i, I get free. stopped by the police all the time and um most of the time i can stop i can get out of it and uh for sure if i post this the police officers will um look into this but <laughs> everything i do is just like how much fun can I have? Yeah. Because other than having fun, like, you know, it's kind of cool when they name their drink Happy Dad. Like, that's what I am. I'm a fucking happy dad, yeah, you, you know? Are. Not drunk all the time, you know? I do drink, but uh, every once in a while, but I'm a happy fucking guy, yeah. you know? And that's just the way that I want to live life. And so Montreal, I mean, which is pretty close to where you guys are, um, BMW wanted to work with me. Okay. And... um they were like, pretty much, they're like, well, you could pick whatever car that you want to drive. And this was before anyone had gold cars. And, I was, and they're like, we're going to make it gold. I'm like, fucking great. Like, yeah. how much better can you get than that? They're, they're like, what do you want? You want the, I don't even know what the cars are. The 700 series or the yeah, whatever, yeah, like yeah, whatever yeah. the gangs. Yeah. I was like, not really. Um, I, I want a station wagon and I'd like a diesel station wagon. Make that shit gold. And they're like, Really? So I got this gold station wagon that they gave me for free. And as they're like doing this big unveiling and they're like, oh, you got to see this fucking thing. Everyone in the dealership is looking going, this fucking lunatic is now going to take his kids in a gold station, you know, station wagon. wagon. 
And so I looked at the guy, this dude, Yuval, and I was like, damn, I'm going to get arrested in this. <laughs> He's like, uh, nah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get arrested. And so the police started harassing me. And they would, they would stop me with my son, and they'd like basically insinuate that I was selling drugs. And I don't think that in their mind they realized, like, if I was selling drugs... I would be in a Honda Civic yeah. somewhere, somewhere in the 90s, yeah. not in the first gold car in Montreal, yeah. in a station wagon, driving around the hood. Yeah. And so we had this whole thing, and I basically turned it into this Instagram post, and then we engaged with the police. Oh, and the okay. police, not only did the police lose, they lost publicly, and they lost heavy. So um, Leonard Nimoy, or whatever his name is um, from, from Star Trek, died um, the same year and, and day. And there was like a little article about his death. And he's a lot more important than I am. Spock was more important than the fucking glasses guy. But this big ass fucking article, like glasses guy harassed by the police, like front fucking page. I'm there in a bathing ape jacket wearing my grills, like diamonds press, fucking no, shining. Press. Yeah, but so people are fairly cautious on what they will and won't do with me mm. because... You'll you go know, right to the end, yeah. Yeah, and, and and the sick part about it is if I lose, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's totally cool. And I'll, not only that, but I'll eat dinner with you right after. <laughs> like, if we, you know, if I lose the game, great. Yeah. You know, I'm totally able to be like, all right, cool. Like, so, so how can you, like, how can you explain that to maybe our viewers that you don't see a difference between winning and losing? Because um, that's interesting to me. Like, I think it's, I think it's cool. I think it's cool as fuck. So I, I have this conversation with my kid. Okay. If my kid, if you have a kid and the kid touches a stove once um, and he learns from that fire and he burns himself, that's, that's a mistake. And there's a, there's a pain to it, but there's a lesson. I learn with a little bit, of, I learn better through experience and through pain. Mm. Um, if my kid would then look at the same stove and put his hand on it again, well, he's just a moron, <laughs> you know, right? And so... Certain people are just morons. And, and to me, people who take loss as a loss are morons. But people who can take a loss and turn it into a lesson, there's a, there's a value to that. So how you get to your education, whether it's through route A or route B, everybody learns different. I learn through failure. Yeah, you need and that pain. I need that. That's how I'm going to remember it. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me how many times I succeeded, I have no clue. If you ask me about adversity and stuff like that, I mean, I could give you the short list, the long list, the cliff notes, yeah, yeah. the fucking audio book, you know? <laughs> and that's and that's just who I, that's who I am. And I think that so many people get stunted by this like false reality of what's going on in the rest of the world and doing better than other people and ha fighting this like unrealistic fight with who they think is the world and not really themselves. And it's just like that's not how I, you know, get down and. Um, and I try so many things yeah. and I'm so like kind of outlandish that I don't, I think that if I didn't think that, yeah. um, that it was a win when I lost that I'd really be fucked up in the well, game. I even think like if you were, if you were had that mindset at an early age already and you were like, let's say collectibles and stuff like that. Yeah. Like you were already in that headspace. I right? was. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk about too, like your first store at 19. Yeah. Like, a lot of people listening might be like, how the fuck did he do that? He just yeah. said he didn't come from money. No, I didn't. Right? So financially, how were you able to make that happen? And what um, kind of lessons did you learn from that business itself? I'm trying to think, okay, it's enough years. I can't, couldn't get arrested. <laughs> so, um, so I used to sell things that might not have been as legal as they are now. Nice. <laughs> in certain states, depending on where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and when people didn't pay... For those products, there was an interesting profession where they would need people to go and acquire said, yep. said funds. Yeah. And so that's kind of, um, that was kind of where I chose to be. Okay. And um, in Canada, I mean, you guys live in Canada too. You can do, I mean, other than murder yeah. and I think <laughs> rape, which obviously you shouldn't be doing either one of the two, Facts. but other than that, they wipe your record when you're 18. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that. they wipe your record. Beautiful. Um, so, because you're tri you're a juvenile and then you're yep. kind of an adult. And I, I don't know that it's necessarily as black and white as that, but I'm pretty sure it's as black and white. And so my dad, um, less of a maniac than I am, 
I think he'd like to be, but f- much more conservative. Not conservative, but more conservative than me, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, he used to be like, yo, if you're going to fuck up before you're 18, like just, do you know, <laughs> do it now. Like yeah. get that out of your system. And so I had built some funds and I had started this store um, much less of a build out than my later year stores. And I had this concept that was, Um, very elevated and very much about experience and I just did it and you know failed to a certain degree failed financially could not uh, keep the store up my partner actually kind of not muscled me out but took it over and I don't think he realized that he was also taking over the debt Um, he actually was the guy that was banging the teacher oh oh, yeah yeah so (laughs) yeah he was banging the teacher banged um, had a kid and whatever. And so, so you were partnered with him on this on the store. I, I, yeah, I partnered with him. I actually partnered with him on the store. And um, the one thing that I learned about it, which again was, you know, how do you look at turning your failure into successes? Is if you buy a full size run of something, right? Your profit is always in the size that the person coming to purchase doesn't want. So if the, if the last size in the whole thing is a size nine, but the dude's a size 12, yeah, you that's, where, that's where your profit is. Yeah, you and now it becomes a crapshoot. Mm. So not only are, do you have to hit the person that wants the size, but you have to, or that wants a model, I should say, you have to hit the person that is that size. Yes. Okay. And that's fucking a downfall to a lot of businesses. So, you know, part of the evolution of losing, I, I think I lost maybe 20 grand. Like, not that it's no money. Well, back 19, then, it was, that's a, it was a lot of money. Especially back then, yeah, it, was, too. it was huge money. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was what it was. Yeah. But for 20 grand, let's call it 20 grand, to learn that sizes could be your downfall. You needed that. That's worth yeah. millions yeah. of dollars. because in your industry. Yeah, because yeah. Now, you could, now you could restructure and retool how you look at business and how you want to structure your next business, and that's fucking incredible. Yeah. You know, so again, learning this, like, while well, someone else, especially in Montreal, would put their fucking head between their legs, and even the city was like, ah, oh, I knew he couldn't do it, and he'd do it. All right, man, that's that, cool. Yeah. But while you guys are focusing on that, yo, I'm on to the next, I'm on to the next shit. Like, so, and if that one doesn't work, another one's going to work, yeah, you know? Yeah. Happy Dad is available at a lot of your local bars and restaurants. You might even find it at some saloons. If you've enjoyed a Happy Dad, then you know it goes well with your burger, your wings, pizza, and steak. (laughs) People in California eat it with their sushi, too. Go to happydad.com slash find to find a bar or restaurant near you so you can watch the games with the boys while enjoying an ice-cold daddy drink. The ladies love it as well. If your bar doesn't carry Happy Dad, then ask them to call their distributor to stock up. You can't have a burger with that skinny can, can you? It's time to man up and drink Happy Dad. Happy New Year. So was it straight from that point? Was it straight uh, sneakers to frames? Like how did the try? Basically, from that point, what brought you to the frames? To the frames. Yeah. So and what was, was your start there? So clothing line. So clothing line. We learned about uh, seasons. Okay. Because at that time there wasn't really a drop model. So what happened when when you were ha- when you had the red T-shirt but everyone wanted the black? Yeah. Same thing as the size. Um, so then there was a size. And so I was living on my own, um, continuing other, pre- other professions. Um, and I lived with this girl. And the girl was very intelligent. And she, um, she's kind of like this little, I can't, if I say, <laughs> trying to say I hope, I'm, I'm wondering, like, because I know my kids are going to watch this. <laughs> And we're very body positive. So um, she was very curvy. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, you see, I fucking... <laughs> there you go. You know, I, Politically I, correct, there you go. Not, I mean, not really, but like, um, you know, I know my son's at home going, nah, she was fucking fat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Should have brought him on the that, podcast. <laughs> that she was fucking fat. Um, no, so this, uh, this, cur- this curvy, uh, you know, Rubenesque uh, lady. And so... <laughs> She was living with me, and, and then basically I was, I don't remember what happened, but like, I think she 
I think she had cheated on me. Yeah, she had cheated on me, and then she like felt bad that she was living with me, and she convinced me to move to the suburbs, okay, <laughs> to like to like an offset in Montreal. And um, at the time, I smoked a lot of weed, like a lot of weed, okay. or actually hash, like not really, yeah, hash. Um, and she convinced me. She's like, "No, nah, I need to save up money so we can be equals." About this whole shit, and I ended up going to her basement and we lived in this like house with her parents and I hadn't lived with my parents since I'm like late 15 and we lived with this girl and her parents in the basement in the suburb I had no car and my friends didn't really want to come and see me and my best friend Adam so we were trying to buy whatever we could buy like you know kind of in the same vein of how do we buy things that have already lost their value and, and kind of increase their value so we were buying like stock lots of winter hats so like we would buy out like the dc or or spider factories hats and we would you know bang them out on int on uh, ebay and so he has a brother-in-law um that had a glasses store for forever and he gave us um well i think he gave to adam but i probably like de I probably deboed them a bit. I don't know how they they came to acquisition in this fucking like basement in Dollard, and I started to sell these things on eBay, and I was like, "Fuck, these glasses like can go for a lot of money." And then so I, I kind of sat down and marked out all these things. What checks my boxes? Is there a collector value to it? Yes. Is there sizes? No. Have they already lost their value? Yes. Um, and is it easy to ship? Is it easy to store? Does it get whatever? Yeah. The, the missing piece to it was what happens when you have to exit from the product, right? Because a lot of people have back stock. They don't know what to do with it. They'll write it off their book, shit like that. Um, glasses are medical. So there's a whole tax mm -hmm. play to it if you really want to like get into it and be savvy with it. So okay. kind of checked all the boxes and I was living with this um, girl in... This fat girl. Fat girl. Yeah. Uh, you can say it. No, uh, no, no, I can't say it. She was... Cur <laughs> she was... Uh, she was nice curvy. curvy. Yeah, I like to... Uh, I like to use the term uh, Rubenesque. I was going to say that's or, crazy. That or, or, that one's crazy. Or, or, may or maybe... Um, Maybe husky. Husky's nice. We could go for husky. Is we could go, is like the yeah, we could go husky. Fanciest and and this is also crazy. like, this is a, at a time when like, if girls would get like there was no bbls or any of that type yeah, of shit yeah, so yeah. you weren't you weren't looking for the you know curviest girl in the room you were definitely looking for the girl who was the skinniest yeah. yeah it was like um, paris hilton like those it was paris hilton right so yeah. so i'm in there at this fucking place during winter i'm the parents go out and work she goes out and work i'm like motherfucking mrs doubtfire i'm in the basement <laughs> They're scared to come down. I'm banging out joints on the lawn. Like, people are throwing eggs at the house. Yo, that shit ended, like, I was, it was, it was a movie. Like, it was, like, literally, a, it was a fucking movie of me living in this basement. And so. And they were just cool with you? Just, just, just doing anything? You are cool. To be honest, they were such nice people. And nice. I really appreciate that they did that. But they were fucking petrified. Yeah. They were petrified of me. I had an illegal satellite running into the basement. I had a whole setup in the basement and people would come visit me. And it like rarely, but when they would, it was like walking into like, like a Godfather movie. You know, they were coming into the basement and people, they would bypass the parents. Like it was, it was very funny. So I had seen that these glasses had, um, had value and like it checked all my boxes. So I was like, fuck it, you know, let's, let's go in, all in on this. And um, at the time, American Express had released its black card. Mm. And the black card, um, funny enough, most people didn't even know what the black card was. They just knew that people rapped about it. Yeah. And there was like this kind of like connotation of success with this black card. So at the time, the company wasn't called Vintage Frames. It was, company, it was called the company formerly known as. And um, it was just a black card. And on one side, it had a spot UV printing that said the company formerly known as, three dots. And then the other side, it had a phone number. And I would literally give it to people and I'd be like, you know, here you go. And if they'd be like, oh, you know, what is that? I'd be like, ah, oh, I'm so sorry. It's not for you, man. And I'd pull the shit back and it didn't matter who the fuck it was. And so this kind of like, this thing spread through the industry that people got their glasses from a guy 
with this black card. It didn't even have a name. I didn't have a website, none of that shit. And it was like more, you know, word of mouth, hand to hand was really kind of ingrained in New York culture at the time. Cause that's when streetwear was really starting. So you had the stashes and Futuras and Norton and recon and Dave's quality meat. And, um, flight club wasn't even out yet. A life was like super prominent and, um, and all those, and all those like kind of type of brands. And so I was the glasses guy for that. And so that's how we kind of got into this like whole thing and, you know, and, and rolled with it. Um, yeah. And it all, it, it all started. Yeah. And, and, um, later on in life, uh, when I'd split up with this girl, um, who will most probably watch this, um, and hopefully she's doing well in her Rubenesque ways. Um, <laughs> I think she actually lives in Ottawa with some, you know, anyways. <laughs> uh, she had me arrested. Oh. Yeah, she had me arrested. So I was dating another girl at the time, and um, she was very upset, right? Mm. She, it seemed that, yeah, she was very upset. And she tried to break into my house. Okay. And, and um, I, had my, I had my girlfriend, her friend, some of my friends there, and I was like, yo, if you don't cool, cool off, like, you can't try to break into my, this is wild. And I like opened the door and I, um, I threw water. Right. And, uh, <laughs> well, and you know, and note to self when you throw water on someone and they do not want to be wet, it is considered assault in come Canada. On. Yeah. Dead ass. So I had these two cops like come super nice. They were like really nice. These two, these two lady cops, Hey, uh, you know, we got a complaint from that. Can we come in? Yeah, sure. Of course. Of course you could come in. Why not, you know? Come in. Yeah, well, you know, you might have to just, we just want to make sure everything's good, so you want to come with us. And of course, why not? Fuck. <laughs> why not? You know, and then I, so I step out of the apartment, and um, these uh, nice ladies uh, turn, to, turn out to not be so nice. Uh, and it's like, you're under arrest. I got thrown against the wall. And I'm like, yo, where, where did this whole collaboration? So that's why I take shots at... Uh, this Rubenesque. Yeah, Rubenesque. Okay. Rubenesque. Yeah, Rubenesque. Husky. Could have been easier. Could have been easier. Just could have been smoother. Could have been could have been smoother. We could have never mentioned her. <laughs> you know, she could have gone quietly into you know wherever she's in. in Ottawa, yeah. But fuck. So you so you started there. That's so when started, the idea yeah, starts. Yeah. So I like, started oh, there. This is, this is the yeah. Way. So I started there, and then um, this part this apartment that this chick um, tried to break into. My father was like always instilling this like never live for rent mm. like never be rent poor um i don't think he truly understood the concept of it but he's like made me fairly nervous about having large rents so i worked out of my house for a bit and realized it wasn't for me i opened this office in a place in montreal um and we were so stoned <laughs> like all the time like <laughs> just all the time like oh that we would goodness. we would smoke so you would go into this building and it was like you would, as soon as you walked into the building, there was like a rabbi who had an office. There was another like whole bunch of other things, but it was, it, it, you didn't even smell the weed. It was just a cloud of smoke. <laughs> and so I was in this office for a while and um, UPS was trying to deliver something. And I see this UPS guy walking in, in the hall and he's like, hey, I'm looking for uh, the company uh, formerly known as, you know? And I'm like, oh, it's right here. He's like, no, bro. He's like, he's like, this is the company formerly known as. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? And I'm looking at the door and I'm like, so my buddy Adam, who was working with me at the time, I look at the door and I'm like, yo, Adam, this says the company formerly known as. Aren't we the company formerly known as? He's like, fuck. Oh, shit. He's like, <laughs> he's like, fuck. I'm like, dude we misspelt our own company name <laughs> for a year and like the two of us are so fucked up we're looking at this going well okay yeah. so um then as we decided to go through the you know go into the internet and stuff like that we needed to get into our brand name and so there's a very interesting concept that um i try to teach our staff kids and just anyone in general who will listen to when you i call it the kleenex um theory. Okay. When you go to a pharmacy or a bodega or wherever you would buy that at, people go in and they ask, for, where's the Kleenex? But they're not necessarily looking for Kleenex. They're, list, they're looking for tissue paper. Mm -hmm. But what Kleenex was able to do is they were able to brand themselves 
as the name of the commodity. So even if you're right, like yeah. even if you're not True. shopping for fucking Kleenex, you're asking for Kleenex. Yeah, so you might yeah, not yeah. buy it, but that repetition allows it to be like culturally relevant. And so the last piece of this vintage frames puzzle was how can we own the name of a commodity? So even if someone's not talking about vintage frames company, they're talking about vintage frames. We still own the name anyways, yeah. they're fucking still talking about us. So cool. when people want to compete with us and they're like, yeah, we sell vintage frames. It's like, yeah, you do buddy. Yeah, yeah you do. <laughs> yeah, sure you, you do. do. But <laughs> Put it on paper. I dare yeah. you. you know? <laughs> Write it down. Yeah. Write it down. Yeah. Just, just once. And so that was this culmination of this like plan, which was, oiled and bred by failure um, and ticking off the things that, you know, I didn't want to touch that stove again, at least not mm. the same. I'll touch another stove, but yeah. not the same one, same place. Yeah. And that's how we, how I created, you know, this company. Um, Brand, the brand name is awesome. Branding, you know, and then our logo, um, which our CMO, like, thank God she's not here because she'd be like, yeah, we're trying to fucking move away from it. Our, the VF? Well, no, the VF is is like our branded logo okay. and the um the vintage frames companies are typography or whatever you call it and it's yeah. fine but i wanted to make a chain as a joke because i couldn't you know i finally could afford to make a chain and, yeah. right and like no one was going to chain me because i didn't rap and so i was like fuck it, i'm gonna make a chain and versace at the time hadn't um realized that they had any cultural relevance like they were on a different path they hadn't realize that there was a whole industry that kind of was interested in them, mm -hmm. not on a mass scale. So I, I was like, fuck, it would be funny to kind of flip the Versace logo. And so I flipped the Versace logo and I made this chain and then this chain became the, thing. the logo. And like yeah. people were like so into it. And so like then we had that logo. And, and so um, we kind of rolled through this whole company and became um, very... Uh, popular for our actual designer vintage. So our main thing that we originally did was we, it's called what well, we call it purveying. So it's, you know, collecting and putting together these very comprehensive archives of actual designer vintage. Mm -hmm. So from 19, like we specialize in 1960s to very early 2000s, 40s, 50s aren't really our shit, even though we have them, it's just not really an interest of mine. So we amassed a collection of over a million frames yeah, I read that. It's yeah no it's crazy. fucking wild but that's you know that's like kind of because i'm balls out and i believe in myself and if i fuck up well i'm also you can, i'm i don't want to say happy necessarily but you know <laughs> you i'm not i'm not big chest yeah i'm not the happiest dad well, kind of also you know? like monopolized it at that point well like you we, could, there's only so many fucking frames that's vintage right. frames that are even out there yeah that if you own a certain majority percentage of them who can really you just become the right. market yeah. yeah so we become we become that so now we have we've checked off all the other like all the business things that we need we've developed the name we've changed it from the company formerly known as to vintage frames company we've fought for the trademark and in trademark law to d to have anything that defines commodities is very very hard it's yeah, yeah it's super super hard to even go after um so, you know, we worked through that type of stuff and um, we amassed this huge collection. And the cool thing about it was that a lot of um, high profile people took great interest into it. Mm -hmm. And not only great interest because we had the product, but, you know, I'm a lot of fun. Well, some people think I'm a lot of fun. A lot of people hate me, but, <laughs> but the people that think I'm fun, you know, we're like, oh, this is, this is like a fun interaction to do this. And this kid's wild. The good thing about it was a lot of them were celebrities, but when you have vintage, just like you said, like you don't know how many are left there in the world. So in a collection of a million, the frame that you might like might be the last one that exists. Literally, yeah. yeah. And if you, so let's say like, um, like Puff or Jay-Z or whoever the fuck wears it, or Kim, uh, Kim Kardashian, and like everyone in the world is interested in that frame, that might be the last one. So it made building the company um an, a different challenge than most because even though we control the commodity and control the stock as we're creating the demand um is that the last one that exists can you capitalize about the amount of time and effort you have to do to to place that frame yeah, to right acquire it and then well, acquire it and you know then you let's just say with you know with kim like if she wears a frame and all these you know girls actually and guys want to wear the frame like 
everyone would know where the frame would come from, but can you, can you get that frame again? You know, and not just using her as an example, but it it doesn't have to be someone at her status. It could be anybody. Um, a lot of people don't think for themselves and want to kind of copy what other people are wearing, which is totally cool. So in 2018, we were like, what if we kind of flipped the script? I've touched more individual frames than anyone on the planet. I don't think there's any optical person that's going to ever um, dispute that because the way that we buy things and how we purvey it, you know, I've gone through like all these frames and all these different things and I've seen what frames have decayed, which ones sold, which ones didn't, because in essence, I'm buying back stock. Yeah. So I have an idea of where they sold, how that market performed, and all this type of stuff. And um, so we're like, fuck it, let's create our own, let's create our own line. And in 2000, yeah, yeah, yeah we I'm fucking- genius, bro. I'm curious. That was genius, bro. Oh, oh sorry, okay. Starting okay, I'll, I'll let you, I'll you Starting continue. his own yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you see it, like it's, uh, you, you own a fucking- Yeah, <laughs> dude. It, a ridiculous when I, amount I remember, of I remember you making that move, yeah, and, and started putting your brand on on your own shades. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, dude, this guy's about to fucking take off. Yeah, we were like, we you were the only, it. You were the only one. You were the only one out there. And and so you know that's one of the things that would have obviously separated us from other people. Like it's it's a different belief in what we do, yeah, yeah. where we're creating. We're not we're not you know we're not being reactive to what is going on. Yeah. You know, which is one of the other things that like on a more civil, less insane level makes it hard you yeah. know but to compete but even then Big like hard. even then when you do choose to maybe be reactive let's say that yeah. there's that this certain lens is hot yeah you can go make it under so, your own well, brand I, I can except i choose to do things i'm like one of those people that if everyone's like yo did you see that movie and everyone's talking about a movie I, I don't have it in me to go see that movie. Are you one of those guys? It, hey, it you makes, know, if doing it's already it, too late. No, it makes, it. It, makes, it makes me cringe just because, <laughs> maybe because I just don't want to talk with people you're, like maybe, that. Like, maybe, I don't want to discuss things. You know what I mean? Maybe you're just not a follower like mindset well, either because like usually people will hear that, like, oh, like, fuck, I'm going to go nah, watch right I'm now. not. And like, if it's a good restaurant and like just anything like that, mm. I... I think that different people have different experiences. So it's very hard to take someone... At, to take someone else's advice mm. because a lot of times the shit that people don't like, I love yeah. and vice versa. So as soon as someone's like, Oh, you know, this is cool. And this is that. I was like, mm. all right. I mean, that's, that's cool for you, yeah. but like, that's not, that's like not especially, really my shit. Especially when you're in that fun that people that are in the creative realm, right? Like when they're when, like someone like yourself, when you're in this creative world and your business yeah. operates in this creative world, like, kind of the key is to stand out like the key is to do is to do things your own way right and sort of set the trends so then i think when you take that like you apply it to your life yeah then you end up being like bro i don't want to watch that fucking movie yeah Yeah, it's just it's the authenticity you know and it's i think it's there's a comfort in knowing that it's okay to choose what you want to do instead of um having you know, having to follow people and doing it. Like there's nothing, I don't want to put people down that follow things. Like not everyone's a leader and that's fine. And I don't think that this is about being a leader. I think it's about being comfortable in your own skin yeah. to say, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what makes me personally happy. It might not make you happy. It might not make anyone happy. Mm-hmm. People might look at me like a fucking weirdo, but that's, that's cool. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? That's, that's important. I think a lot of people, they, they want to be different. They try to be different and right. then they just copy someone else. That's, and it's like, that's the that thing. doesn't make any sense. The, the thing is you're either different or you're not. Yeah. You're either a great marketer or you're not. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certain things that you can't just be like, oh, I want to do that. I want to, no. Like, oh, I want to be the next Virgil Abloh or the next Mark Jacobs or the next, yeah. you know, Sammy or Kyle or you guys or whatever it is. Like, there's an authentic voice that's within them. And the only common thread between everyone is that the, the authenticity is the comfort within yeah. instead of being like, yo, I'm going to do da da da. Like how many yeah. people are trying to do a happy dad drink right now? Yeah, fucking every, oh, every fucking asshole. Yeah. But yeah. you know, is it a commodity that someone could produce? Probably. Sure. But is it a branding and a marketing and a culture that someone can recreate? A hundred percent not. Yeah. You know, so because that's, who they are, mm-hmm. so you know. Let, let me let me bring it back then. Yeah. So you're at this office now. Yeah. You rebrand. No, I'm now at a different office because we've been politely okay. asked to leave that. So one. you're not. So <laughs> still, still, you're not. You're not at your first store. In no, Montreal. no, I know. No. So okay. we, so we're at this little office on a street called Westminster. Okay. And then 
we move into another building on Westminster um, because I don't have a car at this point. Okay. So I want to try to like kind of keep it local. And we move into a medical building because I think it's like, you know, I think it's it's, it's pro, cool. It's all pro. right. Like now I'm a doctor. I'm not just <laughs> and, and so Dr. Move, Shapiro. Exactly. So we move into this medical building, and when we go into this building, the guy there's one spot left, and it's like I, I don't know how it's like maybe four or five hundred square feet, and attached to it is this other office that is not on the p plan, and. um I was like, yo, what's up with this office too? He's like, oh, well, we're not going to cut a door. He's like, just don't tell anybody about this. I was like, what do you mean don't tell anybody? About it? This is like an accountable square foot. Yeah. So we had this office that had a second office that you couldn't see from the hallway. And then funny enough, this, um, this family, uh, the Stearns, um, who own this company called Allenbeck, they bought the office and I was again politely asked to leave because I didn't want to pay the square footage and rightfully so like sure. this this guy who gave me the place is a fucking lunatic and um, so later on in life like fast forward many many years this guy Richard who's one of the like main owners is my homie and I joke with him all the time I'm like yo you kicked me out of the you know you kicked me out of the thing and so uh, and we're like totally cool and he's 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 also a lunatic but he's a lot of fun and a lot more like Still a lot more formal than, than I am. Um, and then, so I'm driving to go see my dad and he's got an office that's like kind of in the hood at the time. And um, I see, now I need a new office and I want a loft because lofts are like a little bit edgy at the time and we stop at this office and there's this little dude and the dude is like paying me no mind, right? He's like, he does not want to rent to me and I stink like weed and it's like, it's probably not a good idea it, to, to rent me. And um so I'm, I'm, I'm like pretty much walking out of this meeting with him and he's like, fuck, you look familiar. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know why. He goes, he's like, do you know this dude, Peter? I was like, Peter who? And he's like, tells me the guy's last name. He's like, did you draw a fucking pair of glasses on his face and film it? And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, I did. yeah, I did. He's like, yeah, fuck, fuck yeah, you could have the place. <laughs> He's like, that's my fucking, like, uh, he's like, that's my, like, uh, he's married to my niece. Mm -hmm. I thought that was fucking hysterical. You could get this place. And so, well, this guy, Peter, who's also, you know, a, a good friend of mine, he wanted to sell me life insurance. I was like, if you want to sell me life insurance, you got to let me draw on your face. And I drew on his face and the videos on the internet. And it was, he was a great sport about it. And I bought life insurance. So it worked out for everyone. <laughs> got this yeah. great collab, got this place. And the place was much bigger than I needed. So okay. you were, went from like four or 500 square feet to I think a couple thousand. Wow. And this guy whose name was Jeff said to me, he's like, look, I'm going to give you a bigger place and your business is going to grow. Because as soon as you go into a place that has a bigger footprint, um, you will naturally grow into it. And then that happened. Mm -hmm. And um, Jeff was great because Jeff was a maniac also, <laughs> very set in his ways. And um, we would kind of go back and forth on who would win and lose battles. Um, and he was also very, same kind of mentality, like very capable to make a call, stick to it, you know, and if he lost against me, okay. And if I lost against him, well, okay. And so um, definitely didn't renew our lease. <laughs> you know, we moved on. Um, and then basically this neighborhood that was kind of uncharted, um, I invested in this whole neighborhood and start to buy buildings and make businesses and stuff. And like, now it's like our own version of Williamsburg, St. Henry. Cool. So I own a bunch of shit there. Yes. And, um, that's, that's kind of that. When do you, when do you get your first like big celebrity placement? Like, holy fuck, this guy just, or this girl just my bought. first big. So yeah. a lot of like somebody big, like somewhere you're like, Whoa, okay. This is, fun. so we, we had a lot of, we had a lot of, whoa, ones. Miller was early, no? yeah, they were, I mean, my, the first, the first artist that bought from us was, whoops, was actually red man. Okay. Um, and I drove to New York to meet red and I was like a big red and meth fan. So that was fun. Big placements. We got many of them. Like, Rick Ross was always a huge supporter of ours, huge, huge and kind of allowed me to curate a sunglass collection. Um, Lady Gaga was oh, oh was wow. probably like one of my, probably my favorite client to deal with because she's some wild shades, wild shit, <laughs> and like you know she would she would 
appreciate the history behind it and we curated this like wild collection for her um what's she like Like, she's incredible honestly like she's fucking incredible and um the (laughs) the first time i met her um i like had to go through different people to like kind of connect the dots so i was homies with perez hilton and they were like very close and so i kind of got to her and um i took a picture of her that I, I wasn't supposed to. Okay. I took a picture at our first meeting and it shot the camera off. And she Gosh. had her boyfriend there that like, I didn't know too much about her personal life, but her boyfriend couldn't be seen because it was like a weird relationship or some shit. And, um, <laughs> and I took, and it shot this fucking picture off and he freaked, he fucking freaked. And I was like, Oh my God. I'm like, Straight I'm fucking, yeah. I'm like, I'm done in the water with this one. And, um, she was so she was like oh no no he probably like just probably touched his beard or whatever and she was cool with it so but almost blew that but the 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 kind of favorite person and the person that kind of brings this whole story kind of full circle was Pharrell mm, and um legend. well led like super like. super legend and so Pharrell um there was a guy, Pharrell had billionaire boys club yeah. And there was a guy named Phil Leeds and Phil, who I'm still friends with, um, linked Pharrell. And Pharrell was on tour with Jay, um, Rihanna, and P. Maybe maybe Kanye was on the tour also, but Jeez. I, I'm not. I don't remember if Kanye was on it. And so I, I went and did this appointment backstage for Pharrell, and P um, was like, "Yo, do you know Jay Z?" I was like, no, you know, like, like, no, like you, you know, <laughs> and he's, and he looked at me and, you know, didn't want anything for it. And he was like, he was so kind of mesmerized by this whole, you know, presentation and, and what I was doing. He's like, yo, I'm going to put you on. And he took me and walked me to Jay's dressing room and Jay had a, an assistant, Carlene at the time. And he's like, yo, Carlene, you got to stop Jay. Jay needs to meet this kid and walked me into the backstage and Jay was with Steve Stout and uh, like interrupted this whole shit. And I met Jay for the first time there. So I think the most monumental transaction was with him. Mm. And there was many other interactions that we would have throughout the years that, and some that were in Miami, that when, you know, the opportunity to be part of his hotel came about, I was like, yo, this is the full culmination of this is like the real full circle moment. And um, which is why when I got the space and got the lobby space, um, I was like, look, money is no object to to create something that, you know, when P would walk in, he would be like, wow, this is yeah. fucking insane. Next level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of like the drive for, you know, how we would get there. So not that, you know, there was definitely bigger people and some, some things more interesting and again like that's a a common misconception because most times companies think the most important person is the most famous person i have a lot more um interesting interactions with people who are the least famous Mm -hmm. and where the where the memory of that transaction is a lot more i guess memorable for me in general because there's something with it that really resonates with me. You know, yeah. um, we have a client, um, this guy, Chad, um, who him and his dad had um, made the Char- the Charlotte Hornets. Wow. Yeah. And they had sold it, I think, to Jordan or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, and Chad is one of the largest sunglasses collectors on the planet. But if you would look at him, you know, companies... You know his 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 unique look mm. is not what most companies would hone in on to give that type of great attention. But he's actually one of the interesting, most interesting people I know, wow. and he's very respectful of the culture of of that. And his collection is insane, like it's insane. And you know, so so you know, when people are like, "Well, what's the most famous?" The most famous is kind of irrelevant to us. The most interesting is always like a lot different, you know. Um, we have this chick in Montreal, Henya. She's like this this old chick who collects um, 
this old Jewish chick who collects um, table settings. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> it's like wild. Right? This, this is like, right. And it's her thing. Like yeah. She's very well known for, for doing table settings. And she like will go to charity events and set up these fucking table settings and stuff. And she's wild. And, she, and her glasses are wild. Yeah, yeah, and she's yeah. a lot more fun uh -huh. than dealing with some of the new rappers or musicians or actors yeah. or whatever the fuck. Because yeah. she's just a lot, to me, she's a lot you know yeah, cooler yeah. so in my mind a chick like her or you know my my client but also like very close friend now chad are a lot more celebrity to me than you know than the celebrities, than, than the celebrities themselves yeah, yeah. i want to i want to talk about how you were able to market it as well because yeah. i was watching pretty much over the years a little bit yeah um obviously like i think the brand that you decided to go with like you yeah. said you wanted to you had the commodity name you yeah. got it yeah then at that point, what's the mindset? Because like you have everything, you have the name, you're like, I got the product, but how am I going to build this brand? Like what what's what went into that? And in terms of the marketing, I, I, obviously you've done a lot of video content over the years. Yeah, I think for five, six, seven years now. Yeah. You were saying you was like the first guy doing fucking videos on IG. Like you were you were no, before yeah. it was like you real, yeah, yeah. but like consistently yeah, before yeah. people knew like the whole th the whole Gary yeah. V thing. Bro, post a video every day. So, you were already doing that. Yeah, so, so we um, let's talk about that a bit because that's interesting, man. So. You know, where it also becomes odd to compete with someone, it's very hard to compete with someone who doesn't know what they're doing, <laughs> right? Like, God. because you can't, like... Or someone going with the flow. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the flow... I don't know what the fuck other people do. I don't <laughs> look at people who are in our industry. Like, I'll go to the show in Milan in a couple of weeks, and I'll be like, oh, shit, I've never even heard of this brand. Like, I don't pay attention. Okay. Um, part of me talking through my what was going on in my head and building my own personal confidence i for about i think it was about five six years i would write this thing called morning inspiration right and, it, and they can they can still be found on if you go way back yeah. but on instagram and every day i would write this passage and this was before like guys like gary and yep. and all this type of shit came out this was me creating a lineage to be able to one day put a book together for my son because I only had my son at that point and um, talk through the things that were going on in my head and almost encouraging myself mm. and like it would it would be written well written but not like traditionally well written and it was fairly raw and always in the middle of it, it would be like it's fucking oh, and then it would yeah. be the day yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's fucking Wednesday and da da da, -da <laughs> and if you don't da da and it became such a thing that people would tune into this all the time. And if I was like traveling in Vegas for a trade show and it wasn't between like nine and 10 in the morning, cause I would get up and write this live and it didn't matter what the okay. fuck was going on. Okay. Like if this wasn't written, I was not starting like not the, not starting my day, but I wasn't continuing along with my mm -hmm. day. And it became such a big thing um, that that's how a lot of people kind of tuned in and the main thing was really for myself, just talking through like, you know, I wanted to make sure that I didn't talk a big game and that I was really living what it was that I was, you know, saying that I was living, which, yeah. which I was. I just needed a little bit of extra confidence to, you know, be the dude with his dick out in the bathroom, <laughs> you, you know? Um, and, that's, and that's what it was. And so we started to produce video content and I became um, very close with um, Q who ran World Star. Yeah who's no longer with us also. And, um, you know, there was a home for the content and the content was just, we were just making it, you know, and it was, there was no content strategy and there was no nothing. And there was no real, like Instagram, Instagram. I only logged on to when I was with, um, Simon Rex, who was rapping his dirt nasty and we were eating breakfast and he's like, yo, you, he's like, Twitter is cool, but you got to get onto this Instagram. And he signed me up the account and we started with, with that. And, um, and the, the marketing became not really marketing. It became the Truman Show. It became how do you, how do you um, be honest with everyone about the wins, the losses, being a dad, uh, the wins and losses of that, yeah. you know, holding relationships with people and friends and, you know, family and all this type of stuff. And, and while everyone was so, like, kind of concerned about, hiding the shit that was going on in their life that wasn't 
you know, marketable that to them. Cool, yeah. yeah, it wasn't cool. Or I was like, well, fuck it. Like, you know, I stepped in dog shit today. And oh my, you know, <laughs> like we say it all the time. I mean, if you document what you're doing, whether you're building a business, just going through your day, those are the opportunities that people get to relate to you somehow. So yes. they see your father all of a sudden. Yes. Oh, I like him more now because I'm a father. Right. Or he goes to the gym or I like him a little bit more. He likes yeah. baseball. Same thing, right? Yeah. And I think you did a great job being the face of the company too because I think a lot of people Which, shy away from being the face of their company, especially maybe in, in the fashion industry as well. And I think- right. Because they're scared it. about their, they're scared uh, they're, about what people think. Well, think yeah. about them, yeah. of course. And you know, I, uh, again, thank God my CMO is not here because <laughs> while other while other companies- <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, uh, this girl, Ashley, um, she is the voice of reason. Okay. Shout out Ashley. Yeah, like when I want to sponsor um, the Micro Wrestling Federation. <laughs> And she um, is takes, that, hold on. Is that midgets wrestling? Is that what we're talking about? They're not called midgets. <laughs> it's called micro wrestling, <laughs> okay. and we are not making fun of it. Nope. it. Is is was just? I just didn't know that existed. No, there's like many funny okay. things that like, or not funny things, but different things you that need. I may want to do, and then I need a voice of reason to tell me that it probably <laughs> is not what we should associate with a luxury brand. Yeah. Um, and so typically brands will create products. They'll bring them to the stores that they sell to. So like we sell to like Saks and Neiman Marcus and Kith and like shit like that and better optical boutiques around the world. Um, and they'll present to them and they'll be like, okay, how many pieces do you want? You want 10, you want 20, you want this, that. They'll format whatever their formula is. They'll make a purchase for that. And then they'll, you know, whatever the overstock is, they'll purchase X amount of a percentage. So they'll have that for reorders and whatever. I don't do that. I design collections or just glasses, and then I buy them, and I produce them, and then we have them, and then when I want to release them, I decide to release them. Yeah. So we have like almost four or 500 unseen glasses that I've designed that we own and have wow. stock of, uh, you know? So while all these people are like trying to shy away from their mistakes, like not all my glasses hit, yeah. you know? I hope that more hit than less, sure. um, but I'm, I'm super accountable for what did great and what didn't. And if people liked it, great. If they didn't like it, well, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. Like obviously like not as fine as if they like it from a fiscal <laughs> perspective, but yeah. from the confidence, like, yeah, like that's just, you know, that's just kind of what it's gotta be. Well, you were, you were making a lot of content at the beginning and yes. you still are. Was there any moments where you're like, I don't know, you're just like, maybe you got a, a some bad feedback or something that didn't go your way and you're like, Wait, what the fuck am I? I really get bad doing? feedback all the time, just, <laughs> all the time. But that's that's yeah, who I am, yeah. you know. Like I, the city of Montreal decided that they were going to plant a tree in front of my store. Yeah, and they could have planted it three feet to the left or three feet to the right. It would have hit in their city's parameters. It would have been fine. But no, they just wanted to fuck with me. Yeah, and so that's cool because that means that. I get the buy-in. I'm ready to yeah. show up for that game. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I filming videos with them and I was like, guys, like if you put cement here and I'm telling the workers, I'm going to put my balls in the cement. <laughs> I'm going to put my dick in the cement. And we filmed this whole thing and it's, it's still on Instagram. No, we're going to pop and that he's up like, for sure, bro. <laughs> and you know, you see the guys like, doesn't really understand. I'm like, my dick in the cement. And so I spent like a day <laughs> playing dick. shadow games with these guys because every time they would move, I uh, I would try to like put a dick imprint in the cement, and um, <laughs> and then finally we realized that like it probably wouldn't be the best to put my own dick in the cement. So you know somehow I don't know how, but a, a larger dildo appeared. Uh, appeared. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then we had this whole shtick with a dildo, and then the dildo, you know, in this plot that they had basically created, we created a funeral for this dildo, and we. And we <laughs> buried the dildo and then we may or may not have had a eulogy from bun b <laughs> <laughs> which came and did a eulogy for the dildo and so um you know shit like that like yeah. not everyone likes it yeah um but you know that's 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 who i am yeah. you can't if you're authentic to yourself you know yes there's a right or wrong but it's easier to swallow yeah. when when you're publicly wrong the, the, this is a little bit off topic but sort of on topic in sure. terms of like just being like yo you're being yourself authentically and yeah. whether people like it or not yeah. whatever i'm curious what's your take on kanye west and his his recent actions I, uh, words 
and just the way he's been fucking moving. Have you met, you met him before? I have. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's but also I why I, I don't know him. Okay. Like, I don't know him well enough to comment. Okay. Um, well, I, just from the outside looking in. So I have um, family who's Holocaust survivors. Okay. Um, I am Jewish. I'm not super abiding by by like the religion part of it, but culturally, um, I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that reason, I kind of stay back from it, from commenting on it because it's, it's a hard, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to talk about because I have so many different perspectives on coming, um, on being Jewish and coming from the culture and actually seeing Holocaust things Mm -hmm. that my view of him would be shadowed by that. So because of that reason, I kind of, I kind of stay away from it because, you know, my kid's great grandmother is still alive and she's, you know, a remaining Holocaust survivor, Yeah, yeah, you know? So, and for someone to evoke that type of hatred and hate, and it's not just for a Jewish thing. It's like, it, it could be any hatred. Yeah. It could be towards people who wear red shirts or mm. people who wear white shirts. And like, it just to me, from someone who enjoys riling the masses, there's a proper way to do it and there's a scary way to do it. Yeah. You know? And you, and that's where like, it becomes that principle in my mind saying, well, like, you know, is your son going to become the uni bomber or mm-hmm. is your son going to become the, the most successful and richest one in the room? And yeah. I think that, you know, I th- everyone knows my opinions and them being unsaid, but it's because of that I don't really touch on it. Sure. Um, you know, I also don't wish anybody, whether they're wrong or not, any harm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I think I think you nailed that. I think I think one thing was that he's just very into riling the masses. Yeah, and sometimes you do it the wrong way. Fair. The 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 one thing that he did say that I actually have a lot of respect for the Jews is that you guys stick together, bro. Yeah as a culture like in terms of like you do you do business very well together um you know what i mean like well, you, I, I read i saw something or i read something or i watched something what they said if one jewish guy goes into business he brings four more with him or kind of thing or they just they stay together is that no, true though no? no i mean it, it might Maybe be in the cult- past it might be culturally but for me it doesn't like it didn't work I, that way for you no yeah. i don't i um i bring people who i think should be there okay and i don't care if you're jewish Catholic, if you believe in unicorns fucking and that's your religion, (laughs) you know, it's not, it's not where I go from. And I'm, you know, I have a proud Jewish heritage, Mm -hmm. so I don't shy, shy away from that. Um, my kids were in Jewish school until I started to berate the principal. (laughs) So you're politely asked to leave. (laughs) No, 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 they didn't No, that was crazy. They didn't ask me to leave. I left on my own terms. Nice. Yeah. But when I, but when I choose to leave on my own terms, traditionally I would light a match before, (laughs) you know, exiting the building. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm heavily involved in that, but I will not like, I'm not one of these people that will be like, Oh, I'm going to choose the Jewish person over, you know, the Catholic person or, you know, however it, however it is. Um, also interesting enough, um, you know, when people are like, yo, cause there's different tribes in the Jewish religion. Yeah. yeah. People are like, yo, what tribe are you from? And I'm, I tell them straight up, I'm from a tribe called quest. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the fuck you're, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Unless you got Fife and Q-tip, like yeah. Yeah. I ain't your man, you yeah. know? Um, so I, you know, I have a different, I have a di- very different version on it. And I really believe that people are people and, and that to me, that to me is my religion. Yeah. You know, people are people culturally, you know, I have, I have, you know, I don't go to synagogue and mm-hmm. you know, my son will have a bar mitzvah, which will, you know, be a fucking rager. We do, <laughs> we do the holidays, um, but we don't do the holidays from a prayer perspective. We do it from yeah. a, this is a time where we gather as a family, family so, yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, so I'm like the wrong, like even though I have the illest star, <laughs> yeah, David, I was say, yeah, I'm like yeah. the wrong, like we got mezuzahs on the door, we got Rappaport to do it, even when we opened. Yeah, I saw the video but, Rappaport. Yeah, 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 I yeah. mean, you know how, how, you can't get much better than having Michael yeah. Rappaport come and put that up. My rabbi uh, from Montreal, who I'm friends with, not because he's rabbinical, just because 
I'm friends with him. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, he's in bathing ape and fucking shoes. That's and, you know, he has a vape company called <laughs> Oi Vapes. Oi Vapes? Yeah, which That's is fucking, amazing. you know, That's genius. Oi Vape, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I don't feel, con- I feel connected from, from that thing. You know, and, you know, one of my best friends is, is religious. Um, <laughs> vapes. And he, you know, feel, I don't even think that he necessarily feels, I, I think that he feels more traditional about it than uh-huh. anything. And so. I don't really know much, too much about that. So, so if yeah, Kanye so calls, though, you you selling him a pair, though. Um, if Kanye calls, um, if Kanye calls, I'm gonna take the call. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. and and I'm gonna give him the address to Lens Crafters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Meet me here. There it is. <laughs> yeah. We're waiting for yeah, that. No, no, I, you know, I don't, I don't. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't fuck with that type of response if it was towards a, a culture that I wasn't part of. Yeah, you're saying it doesn't matter. So it yeah, doesn't it matter. matter. It's yeah. not because it's, it's not because, you know, a lot of it came out towards, you know, Judaism and like the Jewish community. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't have cared if he did it towards his own culture. Yeah. It's just not like, I like people, you know, and we're waiting for the stickers right now. And, the, and um, but we basically have stickers on our door that say, kindly check your ego at the door thank like you that. the management <laughs> and like. and that and as soon as you're like egotistical with me yeah it's like i don't i don't have any fucking i don't give a fuck who you are yeah, yeah you know yeah. and i think that there's a, not enough people that are authentic enough you know some people would be like oh my god i would lose kanye's business well okay man like yeah but there's other people out there you know i hear you Okay, and then what about his? Have, I'm curious. Have you ever connected with, done business with, sold glasses to some would say, some would say his counterpart, uh, Drake? You know, I for a Canadian, uh, I think I have the um, the for a Canadian in in a pop culture industry. I think I have the least amount of interaction with Drake than, a, than anybody in Canada, and not because. Not not for anything not bad. Design, not yeah, not yeah. for anything. Just it just hasn't just, happened. We we just always seem to be at different you know different places at different times. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, which is odd because we're you know in the same we're in the same world industry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I definitely dabble in his world. He's obviously you know a different world than I. But no, I love what he does. Um, I love that Toronto supports him. Like I. Lo- I think he's great, but no, we have very. It'll, I think it's gonna okay. Go so down. Drake, because we we seen you, we seen you watching, bro. Yeah, we, we seen, seen you like watching. Some we seen you like it, bro. Posts. Yeah, Drake, we're gonna fuck. We'll we're gonna get some going. <laughs> we're gonna yeah. go nuts. <laughs> hit, hit Oliver. How, Oliver's got my number. Let's, there you let's go. Put it together. Um, I want to go back a little bit to business quick. Sure. You Doesn't said, have to be quick. I want to go back to that mustache. <laughs> no, we can leave the mustache, bro. Come Dude. on, leave the mustache look. <laughs> yeah. You said you're kind of taking over an area in Montreal. Yes. And and what kind of businesses are you opening there? Or be, getting a in Montreal? Of? Yeah. So it used to be um, it used to be mostly rub and tugs. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I can get there with the mustache. Yeah, you you can. <laughs> I can get there, there quick. There might there might be some left in the mustache. Right <laughs> <laughs> uh, there. Um, yeah, so it used to be a lot of rub and tugs and like shit like that. And um, <laughs> you kill yeah, me, you bro. You fucking no, no, it's real. No, no, real, for real, for real. Okay, um, and me, and funny enough, like so, my first store, which was on Notre Dame Street, and again, back to big kid shit. I always really liked Batman. Mm. Not really Batman himself, but I liked the fact that he had this like. In my mind, he had a bat cave, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and. Um, you know how you get into the bat cage like i always thought he pulled a book or some shit so i built my store like that it looked like a library and you pulled a book and then you were into my in, insanity world and it was attached to a rub and tug um, oh speakeasy vibes like, yeah like a speaky okay cool yeah and and we had a rub and tug next to us and the and um i had sent my assistant in there once just as like a bonus and uh um, as a bonus and they wouldn't let any they don't wouldn't give him ideas eh? <laughs> no they wouldn't let it they wouldn't let him in um or other people because they thought that we were the police um which was fairly like odd undercovers or some shit yeah he just wanted to get his you know just wanted to get jerked off yeah. you know yeah. for lunch <laughs> and not lunch though. so the, it was like this crazy area which a couple of businesses came into and kind of staked as a claim um, and made it a very destination area. And we're all kind of friends. So I opened a barbershop there, like a, a very famous barbershop, um, which I pulled out of, but still on the building and, and it's defunct, but it actually operates a barbershop. 
still that's there, but not mine called Notorious that we built out of like um, Versace, like all actual Versace oh, sure. um, with my partner, P thug from Chromio was in that with me. And then we, opened this juice bar called juicy labs and we made it look like a meth lab down the street um (laughs) and that was a very expensive lesson in um juice bars are not meant for me (laughs) Uh, decaying commodities are not meant for uh mr shapiro and um then i bought a bunch of buildings and stuff like that um real estate a lot of real estate and like in this area there's a super dope shop um Campanelli's this guy Tony Campanelli and he yeah. owns uh, Adamo which is this little pizza shop yeah I was gonna say yeah I heard of it yeah my friends my very good friends uh, Reagan and her husband Alex opened Arthur's which is like kind of like a side Dell's and Arthur's is like fucking slammed all the time it's like an ill take on a Jewish deli um, my boy Satie's has uh, La Rue and Spear there's a new regime there so it's like kind of this close knit community of people who are destination shops um, but I will never own another operational business. I'm not interested. Really? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What yeah, are you looking than, for when you're partnering this, with these businesses? Other than never. This, yeah. yeah, it's over. And I, so the goal used to be um, how much can I do? Um, I think I put certain relationships with my family and friends at jeopardy because of that. Fair. Um, and now it's, it's about what should I do? Mm. And thankfully I'm in a position where it's, where I'm able to, you know, do that. Um, So I, you know, I'm big into like vintage frames is also like a McDonald's play. It's about the real estate, you know? And then, you know, if my son and daughter, which I don't believe will be fuck ups, but if they, you know, if they are of sorts, at least there's something for them to kind of have that they can't sell and like, you know, God fuck forbid. up that God, too. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. I tell my kids every day, I'm like, vintage frames will never be yours. So wow. don't grow up in this way where you think that you're going to be my successor and that's how it's going to go. I would rather sell vintage frames and empower you to do your own thing. However, if you want to use vintage frames as a springboard to do something, why nice. not? I'm, I'm like, I'm happy to do that. But yeah. don't think like you're coming out of whatever school you're going to or not going to and you're working with me and you're going to have lunches with your homies and think that you're me like i'm a fucking killer (laughs) and you guys like either got to get with that program um and prove it or it's just not yours you know don't don't think that you're me (laughs) i was gonna gonna ask you like if you think retail is is going downhill but if you're if you're buying the real estate then it doesn't matter i don't so uh, i don't think retail can i think that retail is going down if retail is not done as an experience if you're focusing on how can you hit your kpis all the time and not like you know you walk into this store you might not buy a pair of glasses but i guarantee you're going to remember being here you're going to remember the look you're going to remember the smell you're there's a whole experience to this and so if you're trying to create experiences instead of like pushing like a gap who's going to push products um I think it's different because mm. people are lacking experience. And as great as the web is, um, I think that's awesome. But person to person is a huge, yeah. huge yeah. thing. They re- they remember that, I think. And of it's course. funny you say that. Like Yorkdale Mall in Toronto, I'm not yeah. sure if you know the mall. Yeah. Um, they pretty much just they changed there. all into experiences now. Yeah. Every story, and there's an experience now. It's no longer just like you and they have like that big Marvel shit. All, like Marvel they do, shit. Like, they have pop ups going on. They have the yeah, Friends thing going yeah. on. They, like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So they changed completely. Right. I think they learned a lot after the pandemic that they're yeah. like, yo, we got to, for, for people to come here, they got to want to take p- stories and do this yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, for so, sure. And just remember what the fuck was inside the store, not just white yeah. walls and racks. Like, right. it, it's got to be more than do that. You, do you do better online or in, in store? So, I mean, it's an unfair question because. Yeah, because yeah, you, you reach more people. Yeah. You're, you know, the online has a global reach versus having yeah. a but local do you notice reach. notice anything? Maybe, maybe the lower price items online and as opposed to buying more expensive pieces in person mm. or no, just anything. Really. So we do things differently, right? We're very, very different on how we do things. A lot of brands feel that they luxury to me is a quality and a, and a state of mind. Luxury is not necessarily a price point. And I feel that when luxury brands want to, want to dictate who can buy into it and support it by price points, 
I think that's fucking whack, yeah. right? Because I hear that. Look, you might have a you might have a kid that works at McDonald's. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that kid might save up for a pair of glasses. And why shouldn't that person have the same experience and feel the same way as the person that you know? I don't know that makes right, millions, millions rules, of dollars yeah. or whatever the fuck you know. So our price point, like our hundred and twenty five dollar entry level price point, should really be a five six hundred dollar glass, and. It allows people to do two things. It allows to take away the in, the aspirational barrier of entry because as soon as someone walks in here, it doesn't matter what car you came in or you know what you're wearing, we are equal. Mm. And there's occasions where you have, you know, celebrities, the richest people on the planet, and then you have you know the kid who's working at McDonald's. Everyone should feel equally as happy about the product. So our entry level product which isn't really entry level, it's, it's an entry price point, it just allows people a barrier to entry to support us. Like how fucking whack could it be for someone to work hard to tr try and want to support someone in a brand and then be like, nah, you don't have enough money. Like yeah, can, that's yeah. fucking whack. Yeah, I, I really, I, that's what I noticed too when yeah. I was when I was purchasing some glasses too. Yeah. Um, I noticed the price points. I'm like, damn, I, I actually ended up buying just lower priced items right. just more, more. Of them, yes right but that's that's <laughs> yeah. a whole other thing people co like you know we do this based on sneaker culture kind of so if you're you know we call it our air force one model if you're if you like air force ones and you buy a white on white air force one and you know that that's what you like and you're yeah. a size nine when comme de garçon comes out with the one that might be a thousand bucks and you're not there on premise with it you know that it's going to fit like a size nine Air Force One because you're yeah. an Air Force One guy. And so that's kind of our whole thing. And we take people, you know, through that whole journey. And people, yeah. once they commit to a silhouette that they like, a lot of people, they they buy that silhouette. Every time you drop a new All the time, version, whether yeah. it's a colorway, a version, the whole thing. Yeah. And so it also allows people to be able to collect them. Again, there's a fine line on should people not be able to collect the brand? Like you got to make sure that you don't become the Nike where you're like, you're like, Oh, we're going to drop all the fucking colorways yeah, yeah. and all of this and put the tick here and put the tick there. And it's like, you know, you walk into stores and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. yeah. You know, and not that I'm putting them down, but they've made it so hard to live into their brand and to be, collect it. that you are like, fuck, like, yeah, this yeah. is wild. I can't even support do you it think, anymore. Do you, yeah. Think, yeah. do you think having like that, that lower Mustache? priced item, <laughs> do you think having that lower priced item, yeah could apply to like any business, any kind of product? Mm, no. Okay. And, I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because there has to be a support of, for, for that theory to work, there has to be a support of quality, yeah, right? True. So you have like, like Jerry Lorenzo has Fear of God, but he, he made Essentials, which I believe, I don't know factually, but I believe is far, is far more lucrative than Fear of God might be. I will, like, uh, right? it's it's got to yeah. be bro the quality yeah. is not the same well but the and, but the quality and the price the quality point, is good the no no it's good yeah but the price point is lower the, i mean the, it's the quality is there's no way yeah. that he's selling at that price point with the same quality yeah. but so he has taken away same thing like he's done what you, you did know, he's done what people want to support yeah. fear god want to be a part of the culture and, and so he's given them the opportunity to do that he's made an offshoot of it which is essentials, you know, we have v our VF signature series. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're getting an 18 karat gold glass with custom, like super high end lenses in the same fucking packaging. And that's really a five, six, seven, eight hundred dollar glass in another brand. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of designer brands, especially in optical are license houses. So if you think you're supporting Gucci, like, yeah, Alessandro did some designs, but you're not really supporting Gucci. Yeah. You yeah, know, you're fucking else, supporting yeah. caring, you know? Yeah. And, you know, fuck those idiots. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Tell them, bro. So, so it, dude, I mean, you know I wear a jacket. <laughs> I go to optical stores, optical shows, and I wear a jacket, which is like a high, high fucking end jacket on the back that is beaded and custom says, if you don't trust us, go to fucking lens crafters. Wow. And, and we will stop a conversation with motherfuckers when we feel that they, they want to like try us. It's like, bro, you don't trust us. Go to fucking lens crafters. Yeah. We'll Google the shit for you. You know, yeah, you can yeah, be yeah. Kanye there. What, are they, what, <laughs> what the fuck are they trying though on you? Like, what are they saying? Oh, like, this is not what you're saying it is. Like, what is it? You know, there's, they a, think there's a different, <laughs> <laughs> there's a different type of beast. Yeah. That wakes up and plays James Taylor and goes to the optical store or show, you know, at nine has breakfast with someone versus the guy that wakes up at four 
to DMX. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is very, very different. Yeah. And, um, you know, we treat this like a, like a glasses cartel. Yeah. And we like, we are going to cause such ruckus <laughs> at the optical show. Like, I'm coming now. You should, dude. You should. Yeah, honestly, yeah, like, yeah. No, you know, and I, and I have the buy-in. Like when Ashley, our CMO, like uncuffs me, and she's like, "Okay, like go." You know, it's like I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> yeah, now yeah. we can, you know, I st just like aggressive songs start playing in my head, and I'm like, well, <laughs> "Fuck these people up." I mean, now, now, now that we're kind of in the topic of money, yeah, I'm curious, like, what is the biggest? What's the best month? the business has ever had money wise dollar wise if you can it's say always it. in uh november december yeah really november what okay, and what, like, yeah. what are we talking are we talking seven figures i mean it can be you know i don't i don't want to dime ourselves out with with, with figures <laughs> um but it's it's a very lucrative month it's definitely <laughs> you see the chains it is a very lucrative <laughs> month um it's very lucrative month. yeah yeah okay. i saw i saw even on the, the the gq video with two chains yeah but what was that? Forty five k those those that pair? Yeah, 45? I think so. Forty five, fifty grand. Yeah, like is that, was that the most? Chains. Was that is the most expensive pair yeah. that you sold? Yeah, he 45? didn't buy them. Oh, he didn't buy them. Someone else did. Someone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. After um, the video, after they saw him. <laughs> no, actually, be, uh, before we okay, had a couple cool. of pairs, but um, you know that's a huge month for us. Summer mm -hmm. is obviously you Very know big, good. but we do prescription and we do like you know we try to keep it. You know, steady. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. One more question. Of course. If someone's gonna walk through the door right now, yeah, um, and see my mustache, and wanna, <laughs> and see your mustache, <laughs> see the mustache, then yeah. look at you and say, "Yo, yeah. I want to buy the business." Yeah. What What would the dollar amount need to be for you to be like, "All right, for both, uh -huh. let's uh -huh. do it." Both right locations, now. everything. That's uh, you know, if if there was, if there was a number, it's a big, it's a big number. Yeah, you can say it, but we say big no, numbers no, on this pod. Yeah, it's a big number. <laughs> Um, you know, I, uh, I don't really talk about money like that. Okay. I'm actually, uh, yeah, I, I don't really talk about money. I don't really talk no, about, no, I, talk you know about money I mean, like that, but, I, you know, um, just, just it would be a lot, it, you know, it would be in, you know, the very <laughs> high millions. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah, okay. I you know, under a hundred, but okay. You know, it would be probably, high millions. close to yeah, 99. You know, I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it depends what the person's lucky number is. Yeah. You know? um, but we do, you know, I'm so different with money. Like, and Miami's, Miami's the funniest. So in Cause okay, you're in this thing. Yeah. This is money. Are, this is yeah. money. No, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. dope. And, and I'm cool. You know, I think people want to show off their money and that's great. And I super appreciate people that, um, that support me, um, us, the business, however you want to call it. But I, so I grew up in Canada, obviously, which we've said many times. And there is one thing that we have exclusive in Canada, which no one else, a money that no one else has in the world. And uh, it is Canadian tire money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and when I was growing up, you would have, dude, dead ass. Like this yeah, is my, it's my whole shit. They were cents, right? It was cents yeah, so, on the, on the so bills. So they have five cent, 10, 25, I think 50 and maybe a dollar. Yeah. And so, and they're like bill, right? They're bills. Yeah. So, as the business started and we would start to go to like trade shows and stuff, you would be competing with companies like Crooks and Castles, right? Yeah. Like who were, were friends of mine, but their budgets were fucking enormous. They would buy out a penthouse. They would have Chris Brown come and perform and like all kinds of crazy shit. Yeah. Like I couldn't do that. So we, um, we, threw, we threw a wedding. We were like, fuck it, we're in Vegas. Let's throw a wedding. Pop it up on Instagram and we'll throw a wedding. We... We bumped into some some uh, escort. We'll have her marry my buddy. Who wants to get married? My buddy Cody's a fuck. I'll get married. <laughs> so we did this whole like wedding, you know. And part of that, people who would show off their money, like that shit's like there's like a weird fine line. So when I was young, and in the public school setting, you would have people who'd have like this Canadian Tire money which you would get every time we'd make a, uh, a payment of Canadian Tire. So they'd have these wads of Canadian Tire money and then they put like a five or a 20 around it, but they'd take their shit out oh and you'd be like, God. yo, you'd be like, damn, this, this fucker is really doing it. And it was the same consistency as money. And uh, so I would call these people Canadian Tire rich. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and um, so as we got into like traveling around the world and we started to go, like a lot of meetings and clothing happens at strip clubs all around the world, especially when you go to Vegas for trade shows yeah. and you'd go with these people and they're like, 
I'm like, bro, even if I'm the richest guy in the room, I'm not throwing money at people. Yeah, yeah. This is not only is it like I'm, people might hate me for saying it, but if someone threw money at my daughter ever, I would. It's a scrap, bro. It's not even a scrap. <laughs> it's it's. I would literally take their skin off and add it to my fur coat collection. Like literally. <laughs> Make a collection you know? out of it, yeah. It's so I don't I just don't like there's a f- also a very fine line be, when you become a dad and like of course, yeah, how of you course. Treat, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? So um you would go to these things and like well we had to, you know, we had to not reciprocate because we weren't taking stuff. To play the like, part. But we well, it's not no, we had to be authentic to what the part was. And okay. some people like to throw money. And I, I think that's fucking insane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would go to Canadian Tire <laughs> and I would take like maybe 500 bucks and I would get Canadian Tire money. And I would like, and I would go to like rural areas and be like, hey, can I buy the Canadian Tire money? And they're like, what? Why the fuck would you? I'm like, yeah, I'll give you 500 bucks, but give me 500 bucks and five cents. So I would go and travel to the States with fucking wads of dude not even wads yeah, I would, cases, dude. Yeah, duffel yeah. bags yeah, 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 of this yeah. shit you know and so i would take this money and we would go to strip clubs with the rest of the industry or wherever the fuck we were going and they'd be throwing money and that like you know they'd be ordering the bottles and thank god we had like we had um sponsors so we didn't have to pay for the bottles so that was cool like you know we had big liquor sponsors that really were behind us so that was great and so I would come in with this money and I'd have my assistants because I I would also be the only dude who would travel full staff. Everyone, same hotel, like same restaurants. We just, I didn't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> and we'd walk in with fucking duffel bags and we would start throwing this money. Because people knew I was from Canada, they didn't really know what our money looked like. And you would see oh strippers or dancers or however you, or politically correctly would say that, you know, um, Rubenesque, <laughs> Rubenesque, Rubenesque ladies, dancers. Yo, they would start beating the fuck out of each other because they're the like, money. yo, these, these guys, guys are throwing, throwing $25 bills, they would thought, or five cents. And people, they would be gathering the shit because they thought, like, yo, why take five of these when, when you got one and yeah, this guy's yeah. throwing them all? Like, yeah, yeah. He, and he's not like being grabby with us and like doesn't really like, isn't yeah. being degrading at all. And like, they, dude. It would be debauchery. <laughs> and people would look at us like we'd go to clubs and, and they would look at us and they would be like, man, they are fuck. These fucking pricks are fucking winning, you know? Yeah, dude, and, yeah, yeah. and nobody knew, you know? So to the point where I started to get like clothes done that said Canadian Tire You're Rich. rich. That's amazing. And I wouldn't even go, like all these people would go and buy like Balmain and all this shit. I would literally go to Canadian Tire. I'd buy hunting gear. And people would look at me and they'd be like, "Yo, they're like fuck. this guy's so that? this guy is so rich. Yo, wh- where did, is that that new is that that new Balmain camo? I'm like I'm like this bitch doesn't know that I just went to fucking Dick Sporting Goods. Yeah. I'm like you know these guys are trying to keep up with me. Meanwhile, this yeah, yeah, thing's yeah. under fucking five hundred bucks. Yeah, you know they're, they're dying. Thing. You know, so um, that's, am- that's amazing. That's so, a great prank to do, eh? That's amazing, dude. But people like the Canadian Tire money. People, so up? I've gone to Eleven, and <laughs> and people are like, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. have any US. I just have you know Canadian Tire money, and they're like, oh, where are you from? I'm like Canada. They're like fucking great, you know. <laughs> there's an exchange, right? I said, of course. There's a tender, <laughs> but um, yeah. So it's like. That's it's one. Of, it's like bro. kind of the contradiction of our whole thing, where we're not like big on that whole money thing. Like, yeah, obviously I wear chains and like sure. you know I have ridiculous yeah. things, but always a white t shirt, you know. But but now stepping out of that, you mentioned of course, you, you mentioned that into, into, into the mustache, into yeah. the mustache talk. Yeah. How many people think that his mustache smells like comment pussy? Below. Comment below. <laughs> no, no, we, need, we need a fucking <laughs> comment below. Like um, <laughs> Name that pussy. <laughs> we we spoke about just I guess more on a personal level about yes. you becoming a father yes you now taking your health more seriously mm-hmm. so talk to us about this kind of i guess new phase that you're yeah. in now and, and how you got well, into you're, it and how you're, you're really skinny it. but you know like <laughs> if you were bigger and you lose weight you know much you know much bigger your dick looks dude <laughs> <laughs> people are like what's the motivation i'm like dude like a, like a, like, a, like a fucking elephant <laughs> I, got, I got a couple of fucking um no i, I just um you can Things can be acquired. You can't acquire health. Facts. Um, and that's really, it's a truthful thing. Um, I went to this holistic girl. So I started feeling really shitty. Um, healthcare in Canada sucks. Facts. 
fucking sucks. Like, you can really, no, but everyone not from Canada thinks it's amazing. Yeah, they it's, think it's yeah, amazing because yeah, yeah. it's free. It's not yeah. free. Like, how many places do you go and get free shit and you're like, oh, this is awesome, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so we have the worst he- healthcare on the planet, especially yeah. in Quebec. Um, and so I was feeling really shitty and I didn't know, like, I was getting depressed a bit and I was like, what the fuck is this? And so I went to this private clinic because my doctor... Um, I think should probably retire at this point. I don't know that he cares as much as the rest of the world. No, he's just, I mean, he's, I think he's lived his, he's lived his shit. Um, I went to his private clinic and they kind of like give you, um, like a checklist and like, Hey, what do you want to test? And I was like, well, I want everything. Mm -hmm. Like, well, we do, what do you mean? I said, I don't know, bro. Like Full if you have body, fucking yeah. 50 things, yeah, yeah. test the fucking 50, 50 things. Yeah, well, yeah. no, people don't do that. I said, yeah, okay, well I'm going to do that. Cause I need to know what's going on, you know? And so I, um, I had, I was quite a bit heavier, like many, many years ago and I just wasn't feeling well. And this, like maybe almost a year ago, um, when I started to take my shit extra seriously, the, um, one of the tests came back that I have mercury poisoning and I stopped eating meat a couple of years ago. I felt better. And like I have mercury fish poisoning too, no? from, yeah, from, from fish, yeah. from the amount of sushi that I eat, yeah. like a fucking degenerate. So I had to kind of cut that out. It's all you can eat sushi yeah. every day. You just smash yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, but <laughs> But flying around the world to go to private omakases and like, oh that's God. like my only, like, I don't like to go to clubs. I like to go to private omakases with a couple of my friends if I can buy it out because omakase is generally like around a bar. If I can buy out that bar, not on like some, not on like some financial flex, but with friends where we can have like a great conversation and actually be around that and fucking drink sake and shit, I'm into it. But I kind of got sick from it and mercury poisoning also kind of hits you like as if you're in a depression mm-hmm. which is wild and i That's thought it was weird. an old wives tale yeah. but yeah it's like depression so i started to see this like holistic healer chick who put me on these minerals from montreal this girl leslie and she's been um you know really dope we actually don't see eye to eye on a lot of things but she's so good at what she does i think it's 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 very cool and i fell in love with pilates like yeah, love, yeah, yeah, love, yeah, yeah. love, love. And I'm such an aggressive person and I'm up so early that the combination of the workout and getting just my mind right saves the rest of the world from me. <laughs> it, gets like, that, it gets that part of you out, out for the day. Well, yeah. Yeah. Enough of it to make everyone safe, yeah. Yeah. you know, before I'm like a fucking wild rampage. Yeah. Um, so I, I really like that. And it's, you know, as you see your kids grow, um, not that my kids are the most most athletic. They dance, and that's great. So I'm super happy to be a dance dad. Um, I, I would hate if they fucking played team sports. I don't want to hang out with people like that. You know, I don't want to like... <laughs> soccer I don't want Come on. Yeah, so, you know, me and their mom, like, you'll know when we are... Like, when there's dance competitions, we're fucking... We won't even... We're front row, you know? Like, And yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, guys, don't even give me a seat if it's not. We're there... <laughs> I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. She's fucking screaming at the top of her lungs. Um, and I just want to be, I want to be healthy for the kids, yeah. you know, for myself also. And um, I never believed it, but mentally it definitely does quite a bit. For sure. Of course. You know, and then you look in the mirror and you're like, well, I got an elephant dick. And then you're like, <laughs> let's fucking do this. <laughs> I got you know? a mustache and yeah. an elephant dick. I know this guy, <laughs> this fucking <Well>. must, <laughs> this, this mustache is brought to you by <laughs> Well, listen, I mean, no, but I, I think, I think that's really, sorry, just to, just yeah. to jump on that quick. Yeah. You know, I think that's really, um, respectful that you're doing that not only for yourself, but for the others around you. I think that's cool. Yeah. A I'm, lot of people just go I'm try to work out just the world jacked, for me, you know? bro. I'm a fucking, <laughs> no, I'm yeah. A fucking listen, savage. I feel that way too. I feel that way too. Sometimes when I go to the gym, I'm just like, yo, I got to get this out of me <laughs> right now so some, I can continue my day. Some fucking dude fucked with me in a manner that I don't want to like get into publicly. But in front of all of his friends, I just went up and I kissed him. Stop. Yeah, dead Lips? Ass. Kiss, oh yeah. Kissed him. <laughs> Love that. Gave him, a, gave him a little tap on the balls, looked him in the eye. Jesus Christ. Said, you may have fucked with the wrong dude. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I'll kiss, him, I'll, I'll kiss a motherfucker in front of his friends. And, and imagine, they're like, oh my God, this kid's a, this guy's a fucking lunatic. Did I really, yeah, yeah, did yeah. Did I really fuck up? Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you fucked up. Yeah, you crazy, fucked. Man. Yeah. By the way, he's not being sarcastic. No, no, I'm not. This, this is, is who I am. Facts, you wanted, bro. you wanted a, you wanted a, you know, a real and interview. Before we had, but like when I was texting you, you were like, yeah, I'm, I'm a fucking lunatic. Just like no, I'm no. a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you could ask me whatever, whatever you want. You're gonna get crazy answers because, but it's, it's the reality, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, with that being said. We have, we have a famous question. Yeah. Okay. Is it about Obviously. money again? 
Of course, it always is. Okay, so it's I'll, a, try, a, to, I'll try to be politically correct. No, about no, 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 no. You like, don't have to at all. Like, and yeah. I'm curious. I want to hear it from a lunatic's perspective. Yeah, I prefer maniac. This is, <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is the final question. Okay. Um, we're the MBH podcast, Money Buys Happiness. Right. Do you believe money buys happiness? Ooh. I believe that money would buy happiness if some, no, actually, I would, I know, I know people who have a lot less money than me that are happier than I am. Okay. Um, I also know people who have a lot more money than me that are also happier than I am. <laughs> um, I think for money to buy happiness, you need to know, you need to have a goal, right? Like what is that benchmark? Mm. Um, because or else it's this endless chase. And at one point, stuff is just stuff. And I can honestly True. tell you from, from someone who is a, you know, I, I, would, I would tell you that I'm a collector. Um, my family would probably tell you that I'm a hoarder. I would then turn around and say I'm a professional hoarder. Um, but at the, end of th at the end, stuff is just stuff. Yeah. Certain experiences you can buy, um, but more valuable than anything is who you're experiencing those experiences with. And I think too many people focus on the commodity versus the company. Yeah. And it's such a huge thing. Now, like, would I be telling you this if I wasn't financially stable in a way that at least I'm, you know, comfortable to know that I don't have to worry about my next meal? Maybe not. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that no, money does not buy happiness. Okay. I think happiness brings money. Um, in a I've lot of cases, in a before. lot of cases, I've never heard that before. Um, yeah, I know. I know a lot of miserable pricks with a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Miserable fucks, you know. And we 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 always say money buys freedom. Money buys opportunities. But it doesn't buy freedom. You don't it, think so? No, it doesn't. It you, let's it say you have money and you want to now travel, but you have to go to work. Okay. So, but like, play devil's advocate on that. You sure. have you have a company yeah. that provides you money. Yeah. My company provides me money, sure. but if I'm not here making yeah. it, and and let's say I'm the face of it, that that, yeah, that do you enjoy? Do you enjoy it though? Hundred percent. So, but that's also a part of the freedom, though. It is. It is, and it isn't because once you once you hit a lifestyle that you're accustomed to, a lot of people equate their happiness to that lifestyle. And as soon as you that's take the misconception, as yeah. soon as you take that lifestyle away, like as soon as there's not that good month. Or that uncertainty, you know, um, you know, a famous De La Soul lyric. It's it's about if you could handle being cold or not, and that's really like, that's really something like a lot of people get money and or a little bit of money or maybe a lot of money, and then sustaining that is not freedom. Yeah, sustaining that's a fucking prison. Yeah, we also say it emphasizes who you are. Like you, like if you're uh, a, if you're a charitable person, and you're given money, you'll probably be I more mean, charitable. In, in some, I I don't think that anything could really. I don't think there's. One I don't answer. think there's yeah. there's one answer. You know, I think that. Um, in my case, did money buy happiness? No. If we had this conversation, um, ten years ago, ten years ago, we would have a very different. Yeah. We would have yeah. a very different answer. But now I'm a happy dad, and yeah. that's and, and that's what really. <laughs> That's what makes you happy. That's, right now. that's what makes me happy, yeah. you know? And I think when you realize that like you have kids or your health and you realize that you cannot buy certain things, there becomes a different value to the commodity. Yeah. And that's where too many people are like, you know, how many chains could you buy? Yeah. How many fucking watches can you buy? How many yeah. cars can I mean, you, you buy? Probably how many see houses people can you buy? have fucking unlimited chains, unlimited cars. Unlimited. unlimited. And, 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 you know, it's always like a, a good thing for benchmark for that for me is sometimes rappers will post pictures on Instagram and they'll have like a whole bunch of chains and watches just kind of look all fucked up on a counter. Right. In their mind, that was money buying them happiness. Yeah. But if you think about that, are they even respecting what they've purchased or acquired? No, mm. it just becomes, becomes like, garbage or Shit. whatever yeah you so know whatever. and then what's next like what's the next hit yeah, like how do you oh what's the this what's the that like which is fucked 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they take the picture, they take it yeah, off. Yeah, and are they happy? Like, cool. Yeah. Like, oh, cool. I'll go buy another watch. And great. It's awesome for yeah. now. Yeah. But then what about later? Like, yeah. uh, what does that do for you? Nothing, you know? Um, so for, for me, the, the more stuff I acquired, whether that was in assets or anything, it became a prison, you know? Is it a prison that I'm okay with living in? Yes. But it's always like, it's always hard for a lot of people to define what is success? What is the amount of money? What is the, like, what's the end goal? And what's you know? happiness? Right. And, yeah. you know, what's, what's, what's happiness for, you know, me right now, it, and I think forever, is, is the people and experiences. You know, yeah. and it's not oh, cool, I'm getting new roles or mm. this and that. You know, like, yeah, the golf carts. The will always, carts, yeah. always be happy. Yeah. Like, I don't want to let you think <laughs> that me running around with my dick out in a fucking golf cart in a bath, bathrobe isn't happiness because it makes me really fucking happy. <laughs> um, but until the battery runs out. Yeah, right? there you go. You know? yeah, no, 100%. And then I'm just a fucking lunatic on the street with his dick out in a bathroom not knowing how to tell <laughs> With some nice shades on, With some nice shades on. You go from a millionaire to a fucking lunatic. Listen, yeah. okay, real guys, quick. I gotta go yeah. shave my fucking yeah, mustache that's, that's right crazy. now, guys. I just got blasted to shreds. Um, yo, listen, brother. Appreciate you having us yes. here. Thanks for coming. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you. This place yes. is beautiful. If Thank you're in you. South Beach, come check it out. Vintage Frames. You probably won't catch our boy because he's a big boss man. But... Which boy, which boy is that? You. Oh, me? No, I'm, you know, I'm here. I'm in the paint. Well, you told yeah. us your role is a bit Yeah, well, role. no, but I'm, I'm, overseeing. I, I'm still like, doesn't matter how big the company is, yeah. I'm, I'm still the dude that's going to clean the toilets, always. Humble as fuck. So pull yeah. up and you, you might find him here. Yeah, Guys, and you might find this, his fucking, this prick's my mustache, mustache somewhere hair somewhere in the yeah, fucking yeah, We're going to shave it. Smelling, like, smelling like pussy and happy <laughs> We're going to sell it vintage <laughs> mustaches We're going to frame it. We're going to frame it. Exactly. Go check him out on IG, Vintage Frames. Yes. Hit him up. Yeah. Come check out the store. That's and, it. And uh, yeah. Yeah. If you guys made this Great far, combo. we Great love combo. you. All right. And if you didn't, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, subscribe, do the duties, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought. Whoa. Oh, I almost fell off the fucking chair. It's Jesus okay, bro. Christ. I did the lean back. So, it was it was the lean mentally. Back. See? So, I just, I professor to X'd you out. Did you just, just fucking professor? Did you just fuck me there? <laughs> no, no, that note. Jay.